ha. Hi, good evening. Uh, I am Dr. Sridhar Kalyanasundaram, consultant neonatologist. On behalf of the National uh, Neonatology Forum India, United Arab Emirates branch, I would like to welcome you all to a great evening session. This is the third part of a webinar series that we have been organizing. The first two were very successful with great feedback. We had uh, persistent pulmonary hypertension by Professor Satyan and we had Professor Ola uh, who spoke on oxygen in the labor room as well as the current management in the labor room. Today we have a great uh, array of speakers as well as uh, chairpersons, all uh, reputed uh, faculty and we are having Professor Martin Klepko, thank you for joining us from Australia. He is going to speak on uh, current perspective on PDA. We have subsequently Professor Vineet Bandari and uh, Professor uh, Ambulavanan, both of whom are from US and I'm proud to say that I'm uh, alumni from the same institute as they trained in. Uh, they will be speaking on uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, ventilator management aspect as well as the persistent pulmonary hypertension in BPD. So very interesting clinically relevant topics which are of great help to all clinicians. I hope uh, we will have a great evening. I would like to thank my colleagues, uh, Dr. Monica, who has worked tirelessly to coordinate with the speakers and arrange the time. We had a clash with uh, one of the meetings happening today, but unfortunately we couldn't uh, rearrange the time frame because of commitments from other colleagues as well. 
and uh, Dr. Rajesh uh, Sharma, who is going to uh, be chairing the next session along with my dear friend, Dr. Junaid. So Rajesh Sharma doesn't need much introduction. So he is the treasurer of the uh, National Neonatology Forum, United Arab Emirates, and he's the president elect as well for the UAE chapter coming up. And uh, he has worked tirelessly to set this up for us and uh, he's the backbone. Thank you, Rajesh. And uh, he is a consultant neonatologist in the Cornish Hospital, Abu Dhabi. He trained in uh, India as well as in UK. He worked as a consultant in Dundee. I was in Scotland with him for a while as well. And it happened that we both moved to UAE at the same time in 2012. So he's uh, no newcomer to the UAE and all of you know him. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rajesh. I request you to take over. Thank you, Dr. Shridhar. And uh... Uh, thank you, Monica, and uh, all the respected panelists and speakers for joining us today. Uh, I would not take much time. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Junaid Khan, who is consultant neonatologist at uh, Sheikh Shadbut Medical City. Uh, he in UAE does not need any introduction, and he would be moderating the session uh, and chair, along with chairing the session uh, with Dr. Martin. Okay. Uh, Dr. Junaid uh, is a, a well-known figure in UAE with uh, training both in US and various parts of the world. And he has also been, was uh, chair of the department uh, at Al Raba Hospital before moving to SSNC. So Dr. Junaid, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rajesh. And thank you, Monika and Sirizar. Um, Nice uh, forum and good evening everybody. And I think it's a late evening in the Australia. So without further ado, uh, I should start. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, who don't need any introduction, but uh, it's uh, just a formality. Uh, professor Martin Klako, who is the professor uh, in University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, he's a full-time neonatal clinician and a professor of neonatology. He had a long-term uh, commitment to clinical research. His research is uh, published and you, if you are interested in the field of uh, cardio, neonatal cardiovascular system, you, you cannot miss uh, his name in a lot of publications. The uh, recent one, which is close to me also, because I'm using uh, the paracetamol, the PDA trial, the paracetamol for ductus arteriosus trial is a um, very uh, famous one. Uh, uh, Professor Klago is a research into the normal physiology, the transition circulation of the preterm uh, infant using point of care ultrasound. This is famous for that. He did a lot of workshop in the UAE, and uh, it was my pleasure also to uh, uh, of attend one of his workshop um, and uh, this uh, his uh, work in this field is um, adapted in most neonatal unit in ANZ Australia and New Zealand so i would like to request professor uh, martin klaku to uh, talk about this uh, hot topic which is always uh, uh, the controversies the pda uh, what to do. Uh, so we, I think uh, Pro Professor Ma Martin is online and he's ready to go. Uh, Professor, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Junaid, and thank you to the Scientific Organising Committee for the opportunity to participate in this uh, webinar, uh, particularly Dr. Monica, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Sridhar are all good friends of mine and I, I always enjoy going to Dubai in person. So I'm a bit disappointed that I can't be doing that this time. But um, at least we can discuss over the traditional Zoom video conferencing now and we can share some knowledge. I'm looking forward to uh, talking a little bit about some of my ideas about the PDA currently and hopefully to have some uh, questions at the end about um, your thoughts about current perspectives of PDA management in uh, in the UAE. My slides are okay. We can see them. Good. So yes. your, your slides are okay. The, great. Thank you. So some of the topics that I would like to cover over the next 40 to 45 minutes, patient selection and targeting, uh, an important aspect as we move forward with management of the PDA. What do we use? Volume of shunt 
the importance of the timing of treatment, what uh, some of the risk groups that we might be targeting. A little bit about efficacy and drug dosing and the importance of that in um, our decision making around PDA treatment. Talk a little bit about this rise of therapeutic nihilism, uh, the, the feeling that we shouldn't be doing anything about the PDA and we should allow it to spontaneously close. And is that safe? What are the implications of conservative management and the inevitable increase in babies discharged home from our unit with an open PDA because of reduced treatment early on? Some new management approaches, medications, the uh, device closure that's uh, rapidly becoming a reality for very small babies in the NICU. And then the finally talk a little bit about personalised medicine or prescriptive medicine and, and where we might Often uh, the, uh, uh, the big meta-analysis by Bill Benitz is the thing that comes to mind when we're looking at uh, outcomes for ductal treatment. As that was a large meta-analysis of almost 50 randomised control trials, 5,000 babies. And if we look... Um, sorry, my slides aren't moving. So let's see what happens here. So if we look at uh, the outcomes for this meta-analysis arranged as any treatment for PDA, prophylactic treatment for PDA, or all treatments, both prophylactic and clinical, you can see that um, we achieved the aim, or well, the aim of reducing ductal patency was achieved in all cases, but there was no, and apart from intraventricular hemorrhage greater than grade two, which you can see doesn't cross the line of unity, pretty much every other outcome that was assessed in this trial, be it BPD, death, SIP, NEC, PVL, uh, and neurodevelopmental outcomes, there was no discernible difference between uh, babies who had received or been in the active treatment arm, babies who had been in the placebo arm, even though we managed to close the duct. And so this has driven a lot of the um, concerns about uh, the effect of treatment on babies and whether there are any actual benefits to treating the PDA. And so no, the primary outcome of ductal closure was achieved, but there were no medium to long-term benefits except for IVH prevention. So we have persisting uncertainty. Are we doing something wrong here? And if we look more carefully at that meta-analysis and many meta-analyses in the areas that we are involved in as neonatologists, we find that there's a, a lumping together of a large number of different types of patients. So there's poor patient selection, particularly from the gestational age, postnatal age point of view. Many of the babies in these trials uh, were 30 to 34 weeks gestation a gestation that we wouldn't usually treat at all in the current NICU uh, management plans. And uh, the other problem is many of the trials were in NICU as they were 20 years ago. So the value of analysing those trials in the current setting to help us make decisions is questioned. There were problems with uh, very, uh, definitions, what was a hemodynamically significant PDA. Many of the early trials just documented it as an audible murmur for example. Um, so that uh, is quite different to what we might do today to assess the significance of a PDA. And there was no or minimal documentation of the underlying physiology. And as a result of that lack, lack of understanding of the mechanisms of harm and when the right intervention point should be. We're homogenising a heterogeneous group and that causes problems with subgroups who might be being, who might be responsive, who are not being treated because they are being overwhelmed by babies who didn't really need treatment, for example. And add to that, we have the high rates of open label treatment. In many of these trials, more than 50% of babies actually received active treatment at a later point in their nursery stay. So to answer some of these critics of the large meta-analysis, uh, Professor Benitz and colleagues went back uh, just a couple of years ago and looked at uh, a more specific uh, way of meta-analyzing this group. And they looked at babies, uh, treatment in babies who received, sorry, open label treatment less than 
babies who were born less than 29 weeks and in the more modern era since 1990, uh, and babies aged at treatment uh, less than uh, five days. So they were trying to answer some of these criticisms, but unfortunately, again, what they found is the same thing, that ductal patency um, was achieved in all of these subgroups. But then if you look down the unity line here for the odds ratio, again, no real, any, any other differences in outcomes apart from that same outcome of IVH greater than grade two protection. So even looking at these subgroups, we didn't get much um, positive result from closing the PDA in the meta-analysis uh, setting. So my suggestion when we're talking about meta-analysis is instead of uh, this title, Treatment of Persistent PDA, Time to Accept the Null Hypothesis, maybe we should look at it this way, that meta-analysis of the PDA is problematic because we are lumping all of these babies with different physiologies and different requirements for treatment into uh, the, same, the same group and then trying to get a, a, um, a result from that. The reviewers, uh, when Bill Benitz uh, summed up his last meta-analysis, the review conclusions were, in the absence of evidence, decisions about treatment of PDA should be guided by clinical judgment, informed by experience with conservative management strategies, as well as considering the pathophysiology, which I think is a very important observation. And they need to be balanced, these things need to be balanced against potential adverse effects. So that brings us to this decision-making process that we do every day as neonatologists uh, for many areas, uh, but particularly in the area of uh, the PDA. So the treatment decision is a balance between the treatment risks and the treatment benefits. And these will differ in individual patients. So the risks that we perceive, the benefits that we perceive will differ. On the risk side, we might have things be considering things like, such as the uh, side effects of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, the complications of uh, PDA ligation surgery, which are real and concerning, the lack of benefit of treatment, as illustrated in those meta-analyses, including the lack of effect on long-term neurodevelopment. And then in, in behind here is the concern that there is a significant spontaneous closure rate, particularly in older babies, should we be exposing them to risk when they, the duct may well close anyway? On the other side of the balance, we have the treatment benefits, preventing respiratory or cardiac decompensation, avoiding mortality, IVH, pulmonary hemorrhage, hypotension. Uh, and these are things where should, there are short-term benefits of early treatment, as shown on that meta-analysis, uh, particularly for interventricular hemorrhage can be reduced by prophylactic indomethacin. We've also shown in our trials that pulmonary hemorrhage can be reduced by early treatment of babies with large PDAs. Uh, and on the other side of the coin is the concern that treatment might result also in chronic lung disease, particularly with use of uh, ibuprofen. So that's the balance. And it's made even more difficult these days, I, found, I find, in our nurseries because we're dealing with less intensive babies. They're often on CPAP or humidified high-flow nasal cannulae, no invasive arterial lines, so we're not measuring their blood pressure, no inotropes. They're often being fed early, which may complicate the giving of uh, some of the non-steroidal medications. So the decision is a little bit harder in the mod modern era of NICU because we have less sick babies, therefore we're less likely to accept risk in our relatively well babies. So how to select babies in our current era is a problem. There are some things that are happening. So paracetamol and acetaminophen was uh, mentioned by Dr. Junaid already as, a, as one of the newer treatments available for PDA. And the risks, the side effect profile of, of this drug seems to be less than the non-steroidals. And we're getting better at selecting babies uh, and deciding about the timing for both medical treatment and surgical ligation. And, uh, we have less invasive options becoming available, including catheter device-based closures. All of these things may reduce the risks and therefore make us more likely to treat to get the benefits. And the benefits uh, are also being affected by better patient selection and treatment effect, and in particular, starting to understand the pharmacokinetics 
of the drugs we use a little better. It doesn't make sense to use exactly the same dose um, per kilo dose, but the same dose for all types of babies, more immature babies, more mature babies. Maybe they should have a different uh, dosing regime and more work needs to be done in this area. So that brings me to uh, the concept of therapeutic nihilism, which is something that I, I feel is happening in the area of the PDA. So therapeutic nihilism is the contention that it's impossible to cure people of their ills through treatment. And it's connected to the concept that many of the cures read treatments for PDA do more harm than good. And therefore one should encourage the body to heal itself, or in our case, the PDA to spontaneously close. And this will be a familiar argument to those of you who talk to or use yourself the conservative therapy or supportive treatment of the PDA. But we also need to be aware, and this is in our modern Hippocratic oath, that we swear that the benefit of this for the benefit of the sick, I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures which are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. So on either end of the coin, the best approach is going to be somewhere in the middle. We don't want to overtreat and we don't want to undertreat our babies. So if we look, there's a cycle really here and you can see where you yourselves fit on this PDA management cycle, starting off with treating all, which was commonplace in some units uh, some time ago, broad selection criteria based on gestational age or postnatal age or being on a ventilator, more targeted selection, which is where we use more specific things, be it biomarkers or more advanced cardiac ultrasound measures to be more selective in our patient treatment. And that's where I find myself and where we've spent a lot of time is targeting treatment. And then we've got this drift into therapeutic nihilism where we don't treat any babies and we await spontaneous closure. And there's a lot of people who've moved to this, a lot of units have moved to this area. And then uh, my prediction for the future is that gradually we'll become more confident in being able to identify babies who will benefit from specific treatments at specific times. And our treatment approach to babies will become more personalised or prescriptive um, along the lines of personalised medicine. So what about the concept of reduction in treatment and the movement towards therapeutic nihilism? And uh, do we have any evidence for this? Well, this is some data from the United States Pediatrics Database, looking at over 61,000 infants less than 30 weeks, comparing two time-based cohorts, one from 2006 to 2010, and a second, 2011 to 2015. And they looked at the um, treatment of PDA, both medically and surgically. Uh, and this is the, the graph of indomethacin or ibuprofen exposure in babies um, less than 30 weeks. The, open, the closed circle is the old co older uh, historical cohort and the open circle is the newer cohort. And you can see that these are the individual units along here that the majority of units decreased their usage of ibuprofen or indomethacin. Some of them decreased it by quite a lot, by, from 55% from down to 20%. The average was 32% uh, in the older era, uh, down to 18% in the uh, more modern era. So there's a almost halving of the exposure to ibuprofen or indomethacin. So there was some movement towards no, no treatment there. Similarly with PDA ligation, same figure, um, percentage of infants ligated, the different sites, and the reduction from uh, the older cohort in the closed circles to the newer cohort in the open circles. So on average, a reduction from 8.4% of babies less than 30 weeks being ligated down to about 3%, so almost a third reduction. So there is some evidence of a drift towards decreased treatment there. And this is some interesting data, um, again, from an American cohort of uh, almost 6,000 very low birth weight infants with a PDA. And you can see that they were tracing not only the reduction in uh, treatment, and so you can see from 2005 to 2014, a reduction in the non-steroidal or COX inhibitor treatment, but at the same time, a rise in other things. So BPD gradually crept up, mortality came down, then started to creep up a little bit as the treatment rates for PDA decreased. So the question is, is there some unanticipated consequences of our withdrawal, our decrease in treatment rates, both medically and surgically? 
And this is one of the dangers we have by adopting uh, a, a different treatment pathway uh, from what we've done in the past is that there may be unanticipated consequences if we don't do research to understand the consequences more rigorously. So to summarise to date, trends in PDA management, NICU management is less interventional. There is the changing risk benefit ratio because our babies are less sick uh, for the treatment of PDA. Despite this, there's less medical surgical treatment occurring and therefore as a result of that, there are increasing number of infants with an open PDA, both in our nursery and also at time of discharge. So we have some options to adopt the mainly untested conservative management or supported care alone. We can be more selective and try and identify patients who will get benefit greater than risk from treatment. We can reconsider the effects and indications for surgical ligation and the timing of when we might intervene with that. And we can develop new, less invasive approaches such as catheter-based closure devices. So turning a little bit to some thoughts about efficacy now, and this um, is uh, just an example about um, when we think about efficacy, where is it coming from in our cohorts? So this is some data uh, from uh, a summary of some of the endomethacin prophylaxis trials, you'll immediately see, as is the problem with many of our um, old, well, not problem, but some of our, a lot of our data is based on older trials uh, from, as you can see, many of them uh, before 1990. And um, the TIP trial, the most uh, modern trial here, 2001. This was early, tri early treatment trials, so less than 24 hours, intravenous indomethacin versus placebo, and these are the closure rates in the trials. And the active closure rate varied from 73% to 96% in the active arm, but in the placebo arm, the closure rates were also between 20% and 85%. So significant closures occur in the placebo arm of these early uh, treatment trials. So in fact, when you look at the look at this, much of our efficacy that we saw in early treatment trials may not, may be due in fact to spontaneous closure, particularly when we do, particularly when we do trials in more mature infants, so babies, for example, who are more than 30 weeks, they, they have a very higher level of spontaneous closure. And if we give them uh, an anti, a non-steroidal treatment uh, at the time that they're spontaneously closing their ducts, we may ascribe efficacy to the drug when it's actually the spontaneous closure which is occurring. Um, and what we're finding, finding in our units, and I think others are finding this as well, is as we extend our treatment, PDA treatment, into the more immature infants who have lower spontaneous closure rates, the perception is that the effic efficacy decreases. But really I think what's happening is we're losing the effect of spontaneous closure rates, uh, which used to be uh, given as thought of as an effect from the drug rather than effect of the baby's spontaneous closure. So the efficacy rate of our drugs is actually quite low potentially. To go a little bit further and look at some of the problems we have with um, trials in the area of the PDA, we have these three uh, problems. We have uh, poor efficacy, we have um, spontaneous closure occurring, and we have the added problem of open label treatment. So many babies who are randomised to a placebo arm in some of the older trials were able to have open label non-steroidal after the trial period had finished. And so they actually had a treatment which may close their, their ducts outside of the trial. So what does this look like? If we go down the uh, active arm here, we have, well, we have spontaneous closure which will occur presumably at a similar rate in both arms. We have the effect of active treatment closure in the active arm. And in the placebo arm, we have the opportunity in many trials to have open label treatment closure even after the period of the, uh, the trial, trial period has, um, has been undertaken. And then we have babies in the placebo arm who don't spontaneously close and presumably don't receive open label treatment. And we have a group of babies in the active arm who despite active treatment will have uh, still be open, so they'll have failed treatment. And then finally, there's a group of babies in the active treatment who may actually suffer harm if they don't have a significant PDA. 
So if you see here that we have a problem in that there's not a lot of difference between these two um, arms, placebo arm and active arm. And importantly, we often use the placebo arm as a surrogate for the open PDA. So this assumption is if the baby gets placebo, then they'll suffer the effects of an open PDA. And similarly, if the baby has active treatment, then the duct will be closed and they will be protected from the effects of an open PDA. But as you can see here, this is too simplistic and it's not what happens in the typical um, arms of a PDA trial. Because of these three problems up here, which muddy the waters significantly. So that is one of the reasons why we don't see, I think, uh, significant differences in important outcomes because of this mixing between the two groups because of these characteristics when we're looking at PDA management. So what can we do to, um, uh, to help in our selection? So we want to be able to uh, select candidates for treatment who have a good response rate who are going to have benefit from treatment and who will have a decrease in harm. That's our ideal uh, selection, uh, what we would like to achieve by selecting babies. And we can select babies in different ways. Uh, we can uh, use clinical criteria, lower birth weight and lower gestational age, more likely to not have spontaneous closure and therefore benefit from treatment. That also uh, is babies who have, uh, mothers didn't have full antenatal corticosteroid cover. Babies who are mechanically ventilated with worse respiratory distress syndrome, increased respiratory support may benefit more from PDA treatment. And babies who are less than two weeks of age are more likely to, um, to have uh, PDA closure with treatment. And I'll show you some data on that shortly. And then of course we have um, ultrasound um, and that's where I've spent a lot of my time is trying to understand the parameters on ultrasound that might predict the candidates will have the best response, get the best benefit for the least harm. And you can see there's a series of uh, parameters that we've used. And if we go through that uh, in a graphical way, uh, one of the things that's probably most important is the uh, able to understand the shunt, the systemic to pulmonary shunt. And what is the volume of that shunt? That's probably the key factor that we're interested in, but it's difficult to directly measure the volume of shunt. So we're stuck with some um, intermediate parameters and they include things like the diameter of the ductus arteriosus itself. And clearly the, the bigger the pipe, the more that can flow down. So the diameter has some relationship to the volume of shunt. We also can look at the flow patterns in the ductus arteriosus, which uh, have some predictive value for a significant uh, PDA. Then we can look for evidence of systemic hypoperfusion, whether it be effects on cerebral blood flow with ductal steel, whether it be effects on the gut and lower body blood flow with reverse flow in the di and diastole in the descending aorta, or it may be evidence of babies with low blood pressure, so hypotension. So this is the group of babies with a hemodynamically significant PDA have a lower blood pressure uh, than babies without a hemodynamically significant PDA. Then we can look on this side, pulmonary flooding. In, as the systemic to pulmonary shunt increases, we can have uh, increased pulmonary blood flow, and this may manifest as pulmonary hemorrhage. And in our study and in other studies, increased ductal diameter uh, is associated strongly with increased pulmonary hemorrhage. So that's showing, again, evidence of increased pulmonary blood flow. And finally, at a later stage, dilatation of the heart with the LA aortic ratio and left ventricular end diastolic diameter increasing. And these are the babies who often end up with a ligation. So trying to understand the volume of the shunt uh, using various parameters, often multiple parameters, is one way of selecting uh, patients. So what a bit about a, a little bit about timing now and uh, the PDA physiology and uh, along the top here we have a timeline of uh, a baby's course in the nursery from delivery resuscitation the transitional period through day one and then if we look at uh, what's happening to the pulmonary pressures in a term baby often the pulmonary pressure is uh, quickly drops and it's down to the normal level within the first 24 hours in preterm infants, that pulmonary pressure drop may be less, and that actually protects, or maybe slower, that actually protects a baby uh, 
from uh, developing significant systemic to pulmonary shunt. Uh, and so the, um, initially the left to right PDA shunt is not so large, but as time goes on and the pulmonary pressures begin to drop, there's opportunity for the left to right PDA shunt to increase. And it depends a little on, on uh, how quickly this pulmonary pressure drops as to how quickly this shunt will develop. And as the shunt um, develops over time, uh, some babies, there will, be a, uh, there will be increasing left to right um, PDA shunt because the PDA fails to constrict and close in these first few days. And that again, provides the opportunity for systemic pulmonary shunt. And that can result in some of the side effects, we, or some of the effects we see early on, which we may ascribe to uh, the open PDA and the left to right shunt, hypotension, pulmonary hemorrhage and intraventricular hemorrhage. And then later on, uh, we have the um, effect uh, on the lungs. And this again is a multifactorial effect rather than necessarily a direct effect from a patent PDA. So if we look at um, treatment points, uh, if, we, if we give baby, uh, baby prophylactic treatment here before any of these things occur, then there's the potential to reduce the incidence of hypotension, pulmonary hemorrhage and IVH. And as you saw from the meta-analysis, we have evidence for this in terms of IVH, and several smaller clinical studies have shown reduction in pulmonary hemorrhage with treatment at this time point, as well as decreased hypotension. If we treat a little bit later, uh, after, at, at the end of day one, we might start to miss the opportunity to, interfere, to intervene in some of these um, adverse effects. And as we go along with later and later treatment, there's less and less opportunity to uh, affect these outcomes and babies um, in later treatment trials may suffer complications from left to right shunt uh, if we um, treat a little bit later. So the timing of treatment and understanding the change in physiology occurring and the relationship of some of these outcomes to that is important when we're looking again at the risk benefit ratio about whether we should be treating an individual infant. If we look at this in another way, uh, along the uh, side here, we have the different approaches to treatment from prophylaxis in the first 12 hours, all the way up to very late treatment for babies developing heart failure at uh, months of age uh, or no treatment. Along the top here are the outcomes that we might desire, closure of PDA, decreased hemorrhages, decreased ligation rates, and then looking at unnecessary treatment and the risk of uh, NEC and uh, mortality. So in a prophylactic approach, um, we can obtain good closure of the PDA, we can protect against IVH and pulmonary hemorrhage, we can reduce ligation rates, but the problem with prophylaxis is that we're giving it to unselected patients so we have an unnecessary treatment rate and that might also result in side effects, which were not, uh, not didn't, in a baby who didn't actually need the treatment. You can take our approach, which is an early targeted approach. So actually try and target treatment. So you get, you get all the benefits of early treatment in babies that need the drug, but you hopefully exclude babies who don't need the drug. So you reduce the unnecessary treatment. And then there's other approaches, um, early, early pre-symptomatic, early symptomatic, late symptomatic, with a gradual decrease in efficacy as the baby gets older. Um, no protection from the early complications of PDA, potential complications, and less protection from uh, prevention of ligation. But of course, the treatment becomes more and more specific and necessary as time goes on. And then we have the risks of NEC and mortality in babies who receive no treatment. Again, mainly in uh, epidemiological associative studies that we see these um, effects, but they are there and of concern if we decide not to treat the PDA at all. So what about timing of treatment? Um, and this is some data extracted from the Cochrane Review on PDA treatments, uh, looking at non-steroidals at different time points, one to 24 hours, 25 to 47 hours, et cetera, up to greater than seven days. And if you look uh, down here at the overall closure rates, you can see that the highest closure rates we're in babies who receive treatment in the first uh, 24 hours. So there's a little bit of a hint here that treatment uh, may be more efficacious if given early on in the first 24 hours. 
Uh, is there any other evidence for this? Well, this is a, a trial from a couple of years ago um, of a reasonable number of babies, 139 ELBW babies who had an echo diagnosis of PDA. Some were treated um, at less than 24 hours and others were treated at, at later time points. These were small babies, 26 weeks, 807 grams. It's a retrospective review of response rates. But what you can see is that the uh, babies who received treatment in the first 24 hours had an 85% closure rate, whilst babies who received treatment greater than 72 hours only had a 48% closure rate. So again, in this single centre trial, there's some evidence that early treatment means uh, a better PDA closure rate. So one could argue that if you want to get good efficacy and um, you want to get good treatment effects, then earlier treatment is important. But the other side of that is we need to then be able to identify babies who are going to need treatment, that we think will need treatment later. Because we don't want to be giving unnecessary treatment to babies who have closing PDAs. So, uh, moving on to the next topic, failed treatment, what next? Uh, do we do further courses of non-steroidals and put the baby at risk of increased side effects? There is some evidence that longer or prolongation of courses may result, for example, in NEC. We can start to look at other drugs with better side effect profile, profiles, such as paracetamol. Uh, and we can look at a supportive approach um, until we are limited by that, be it failure to gain weight or unable to wean from significant respiratory support. Um, and many units are adopting this approach. We can relook at our surgical closure, which is, has a very good efficacy, but it has significant adverse effects. Or we can uh, wait for the onset of the non-invasive device-based closures, which we'll talk about briefly at the end, a new device that can do that. So briefly looking at other, other treatments, this is the Cochrane Review of Paracetamol, published just uh, a year ago. Eight studies, almost 1,000 infants. Five studies looked at paracetamol versus ibuprofen um, and showed no significant difference in, in failure. So it's similar efficacy with paracetamol to ibuprofen, less side effects in the paracetamol group, less gastrointestinal bleeding. Two studies compared prophylactic paracetamol with a placebo. Paracetamol, again, had evidence of uh, better, of uh, closing uh, better than the spontaneous closure rates. Two studies compared paracetamol with indomethacin. Again, no difference in failure to close PDA, so similar efficacy, but the side effect profile was uh, better in the paracetamol group. In this case, it was less uh, creatinine, less high creatinine levels in paracetamol group. So paracetamol certainly has uh, some place in treatment of the uh, PDA and so it seems to be at least e as efficacious as ibuprofen in these initial uh, studies, but with better side effect profile. And just to draw your attention to this article that many of you may have seen, but uh, this is uh, a again a very uh, interesting way to look at uh, some of our data around treatment modalities versus outcomes. This is a, this, the network meta-analysis by uh, Suvik Mitra et al. Published in JAMA 2018, 68 randomised controlled trials, almost 5,000 infants. And they used a, a thing that's fairly hard to explain, and you need to go and look at this paper yourself, but the mean surface under the cumulative ranking curve, uh, which was a way of trying to, um, to rank uh, the various treatments versus outcomes. And green is uh, generally regarded as a good outcome. Uh, orange to red is a poor outcome. And you can see here, interestingly, the treatment modality which had the best um, measure of uh, PDA closure was actually high dose oral ibuprofen. Uh, so the double dose oral ibuprofen. And uh, it also, if you look down this uh, column, had uh, a better side effect profile as well, um, and what, but didn't have such as much effect on things like interventricular hemorrhage as other medications might have. So it's an interesting way to look at the different treatment regimes and approaches to uh, treatment. And I'd uh, draw your attention to this. And there's a lot of other great information uh, in this paper for understanding the re different treatment modalities and their effect on different outcomes. So it brings me to a supportive care um, as an alternative to PDA treatment. Um, and supportive care usually consists of some sort of combination of these things, no non-steroidal treatment, 
optimising the positive pressure settings and the CPAP settings, careful fluid management, including fluid restriction and judicious addition of diuretics at certain points. There are risks uh, that have already been identified, caloric restriction and uh, restricting the fluids too severely, uh, which results in reduced cardiac output or systemic blood flow, and the risks of um, excessive use of diuretics. Despite this though, and despite really any randomised trials, this has become common practice in many NICUs after failed uh, non after for, as primary care, and also of course occurs um, as a treatment for failed non-steroidal if treatment with the um, duct still open despite having received non-steroidal treatment. So is supportive care safe? There's a concern about prolonged exposure to volume loads and the effect on pulmonary vasculature. Heart failure is not common, but it occasionally occurs. Is it effective? There's non-randomised studies show variable outcomes. More recently, some larger cohorts seem to be showing some improved outcomes, but there are some problems that with their accounting for initial PDA deaths, for example, and deaths uh, without ultrasounds, uh, knowing whether there was a PDA-related complication or not. So I'd just like to briefly look at two trials of supported care. The first is um, in a Korean unit, a retrospective review of two approaches, uh, 178 infants in a single centre study, small babies, 23 to 26 weeks, all diagnosed with a significant PDA. In the first period, this unit had a mandatory closure regime. So they used medical treatment aggressively, followed by ligation, and had significantly high ligation rates in these very small babies. Period two, they completely changed their approach. No medical or surgical treatment, managed their babies with fluid, diuretics and PEEP, a typical supportive care uh, regime. And if you look at uh, what happened uh, in their units, there was a significant um, a reduction in, um, or change in the PDA uh, rates. So you can see here, this is period one, and there's uh, when they had mandatory closure, um, uh, protocol. You see, as, as expected, there's a very quick reduction in the um, number of babies with the PDA uh, until it stabilises here and most babies are closed, uh, but, well, all babies were closed by the time they were discharged. And then if we look at um, the uh, group of babies in the second cohort where they didn't have a, um, uh, an aggressive closure regime, uh, there were still, of course, closures, spontaneous closures. So this is really looking at the, uh, the actual spontaneous closure rate of PDAs because these babies didn't receive treatment. And so there was a slower reduction in the PDA um, patency rate, but eventually all babies closed. And in this cohort of 91 babies, uh, every baby closed their PDA prior to uh, discharge, which seems unlikely to me because in our setting, when, even when we have fairly um, early aggressive treatment, we still have a number of babies who don't close their PDAs and who are discharged with an open PDA. I did ask, have the opportunity to ask the um, primary author of this article what he thought was the contributor to why they had such good spontaneous closure rates. And he attributed this to their early fluid management uh, protocols, which were actually quite conservative with quite low mils per kilo rates for babies in the first few days of life, regardless of their PDA status. So I thought that was an interesting uh, observation and maybe something we need to go back and have a look at. The second and uh, the other thing I should say is there's no different in the morbidities uh, or mortalities in those two different cohorts of babies in the Korean trial. Second trial is a retrospective cohort study in two European units. Again, a large trial, 297 infants. And in this unit, they managed to treat only 17 babies. Uh, the rest, 280 babies, were conservatively managed with supportive care. They all had routine ultrasounds to, to understand when their duct actually closed, and 85% of the babies had their duct closed, pre were closed spontaneously pre-discharge, which means that there were 50 infants who had an open PDA at discharge in this group of 297 babies. And again, they, they, there were no significant associations between neonatal morbidities and the persistence of the PDA. So there was no increase in adverse effects compared to their historical rates. 
Now, these, uh, this group had enough uh, babies to actually separate out the babies into different gestational age groups. Similar uh, chart as before with the PDA prevalence along this axis and the day of closure of PDA along this axis. And we can see that um, for babies who are greater than 30 weeks, uh, the, the closure rates, uh, spontaneous closure rates quite high. Most babies are closed by two or three weeks. And then as we get progressively more immature, the uh, closure rates are less and less and the prevalence is longer and longer. And in fact, if you look uh, at the smallest babies at less than 26 weeks, the medium time to closure was actually 71 days. So babies less than 26 weeks were exposed to 10 weeks of systemic to pulmonary shunt. And that's, I suppose, one of the reasons why I think we need to study this a little bit more carefully, because that's a long time to be exposed to a potential significant shunt. And as we heard, 50 were open at discharge. So 26 infants died in this um, cohort. 16 of them had a cause of death potentially related to a PDA, IVH, NEC, pulmonary hemorrhage. So there were babies who died of ductal complications. Many of them died early. 10 infants died before seven days and all had a documented PDA, none received treatment. So there, there is a cost potentially for not treating the PDA in terms of early death and complications. But overall, there were no difference otherwise in morbidities of treated infants. They had 50 babies open at discharge and you can see that here's the end part of their flow chart. 280 babies not treated. 43 in this had open PDA at discharge. There were 17 treated, seven of them open PDA at discharge, so a total of 50 open. And then by one year of age, 30 have closed. So there were still 20 babies requiring follow-up from this cohort. Uh, so it's about 10% of their, or a little bit less, 8% of their babies still required follow-up because of an open PDA. And here um, is data from another uh, trial looking at very low birth weight infants with PDA. 68 babies discharged with a PDA. Most of them closed, 52. Some of them were closed with a catheter. Uh, seven still had a duct open, even at three years of age. So there's a significant um, uh, impost with these babies with ducts still open because they require consideration about um, management of shunt. Many of, some of these babies may still be on diuretics. Uh, delayed ligation, uh, which may have its own complications. They may be become eligible for device closure. And then there's a resource utilisation with cardiology follow-up appointments. And finally, the, the risk of PPHN or Isomega syndrome, particularly if there's associated uh, oxygen dependency and babies who are at risk of pulmonary hypertension. And the outcomes for these babies are not yet well documented and I think need to be because it is one of the complications of adopting a therapeutic nihilism approach and just using supportive treatment in your management of a PDA. I've mentioned the device closure a couple of times as a potential uh, game changer in the setting of um, PDA management with high efficacies and low side effect rates. This is the Amplaza Piccolo Occluder. You can see it's a very small device, uh, now CE and FDA approved. Can be inserted by a transvenous approach, which is great for small babies, so you don't get arterial complications. And can be used in small babies down to 700 grams, uh, greater than three days of age. And as I mentioned, the initial trials have shown high success rates, low complication rates. This comes in from the venous side and is thread across uh, into the ductus arteriosus. As you can see, the device is delivered, it's deployed, and then the catheter can be removed and you have uh, complete occlusion of the ductus arteriosus. And um, so if we look uh, at the evidence for this, there's been a, a recent review of this just published in Journal of Pediatrics uh, in the last few months. Uh, and these are the trials of the device that have been done in babies less than 2.5 kilos. You can see that the success rates are high, uh, number of successful implants versus attempted. Uh, the baby's weights on average are around about one, one to 1 1.5 kilos, and there's some major adverse effects, but not a lot. So again, some encouraging data. And if we look at the individual studies, this is one of the initial studies of transcatheter closure in extremely preterm babies.
And we just look at uh, the weights of babies who were treated with an occluder. You can see there are a significant number of babies now below 1,000 grams who have been successfully treated with a catheter device. So this has uh, some potential advantages for us in that there's high success rate, high efficacy, and the uh, side effect uh, profile is certainly less than surgical ligation and probably less than medical treatment as well. So in the final uh, few slides of my talk, just to move, just like to move to where we go in the future. Um, so I've mentioned precision or personalised medicine and prevention and treatment strategies that take individuals into account as, are becoming more important in all parts of medicine. So I think this is a challenge for us is to try to personalise or precision our treatments by using some of the things I've discussed in this talk, patient characteristics, be it clinical, echocardiographic, biomarkers, understanding the timing of the treatment and how it relates to the physiology and the uh, efficacy of drugs. Spending more time understanding the dosing and individual pharmacokinetics. The PDA treatment is, is different to a lot of other treatments. It's not necessarily the peak that we're after, it's the area under the curve. And how to maximise the area under the curve to get ductal closure is something that we need to spend more time on. Use of predictive algorithms that might combine some of these things together may be useful and understanding the predisposition of genetics and uh, different responses, for example, to non-steroidals or to paracetamol. So this is the rise of personalised medicine and this is ready, I think, to take over in time from the current uh, therapeutic nihilism approach. So there are trials uh, looking, uh, trying to look into some of these new ways of assessing the PDA, and these are four that I'm aware of, the Triocarpi French trial, early ibuprofen treatment in selected babies with large PDA. The uh, abstract of this was to be presented at the 2020 PAS, but of course with the cancellation, it was actually uh, presented online. The Baby Oscar trial from the UK, Samir Gupta, selective early closure of PDA, still underway. The Beneductus trial from Germany, Willem de Bood, early treatment versus expected management in a specific group of selected babies. And finally, our smaller Australian trial uh, with Kurt DeWall, early non-steroidal treatments versus supportive care, which I'll just show you a couple of quick slides on. So this is a trial that's about to be published in the Journal of Pediatrics. 72 infants were enrolled. It was a pilot trial of babies who were selected by being less than 29 weeks, less than 72 hours, with a simplistic parameter of a PDA greater than 1.5 millimetres. Uh, and we uh, randomised these babies to receive non-steroidal, uh, either indomethacin or ibuprofen or placebo. The important aspect of this trial, uh, which we wanted to test, was we only wanted to give supportive care alone and not allow any open label non-steroidal. Uh, I've already mentioned that many of the PDA trials are contaminated by high open label non-steroidal rates. So we forbid open label from our study. So this is the way the trial ran. Uh, we had eligibility. We gave non-steroidals. We repeated the cardiac or placebo. Babies were eligible for a second course if the duct still hadn't closed after the first course of treatment and medication. And then we uh, observed the babies uh, post-intervention um, and provided supportive care, increased CPAP, increased oxygen, diuretics, fluid restriction if needed. And there was the ability to triage for the baby to have a surgical ligation if uh, certain criteria uh, were met. Now, our outcomes were not what you might expect. If we were just, this is a pilot trial, and what we were interested in was two things. We were interested in the enrolment feasibility. Would parents and would clinicians accept a trial where we were abandoning the use of um, treatment and, and not allowing open label treatment? That's the way it was really looking because we had a standard way of treating babies with uh, non steroidals we were proposing that we would give the placebo instead, and on top of that, we wouldn't allow any open label treatment. Now, 54% of uh, parents actually consented, so uh, it was maybe a little bit lower than some of our trials, but it still was feasible to, to do a larger trial if 50, 50 to 60% of parents would enrol. And the rate of open label treatment was one in each arm, so 3%. So we also showed that it was possible to do a trial with very low open label treatment rates. And we also found there was minimal clinician lack of equipoise, 
Other, in other words, clinicians were all happy to enrol babies into this trial. We did look at other standard secondary outcomes. The PDA closure rate was higher in the non-steroidal group, as you might expect, and we found no other differences, but clearly very underpowered with only 72 patients to look at other clinical outcomes. This was a pilot trial in preparation for a larger trial with a similar protocol, proving that it was uh, possible uh, to do. So I'd just like to sum up uh, in conclusion, uh, some of the things we've looked at today, earlier treatment points appear to give improved efficacy and uh, maybe we should be thinking about early treatment, but to do that, we need to identify babies who really need the treatment. We know that prophylactic treatment results in 80 to 90% closure rates. Uh, and it's biased, though, by spontaneous closure rates and the open-label treatment received in many trials. Later treatment closure rates are reduced down to only 50 to 60%. Differences are likely to due to, be due to patient variability and the need to adjust dosage in older infants. So we need to know more about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of our PDA drugs. There's an increasing interest in conservative or supportive therapy alone of the PDA because of poor efficacy of the non-steroidals and the failure or the perceived failure to alter outcomes. And I think that sometimes it is very often a perceived failure because we don't look at the limitations of our meta-analysis. Conservative treatment is uh, simple, but it's untested. And the effect of a prolonged, untreated systemic pulmonary shunt should be carefully considered. Cohort studies of conservative PDA management, management of selected patients have not shown harm, however, uh, except for possibly some increased death rates uh, in the first week of life. We've got this tension at the moment between groups who are interested in therapeutic nihilism versus groups such as ourselves who are trying to develop more sophisticated ways to personalise treatment into our babies. And the availability of non-invasive closure techniques uh, may be a game changer with less risk, more efficacy, and the possibility of earlier treatment, even at the bedside in the NICU, is uh, proposed for this uh, new device. So I'd like to just leave you with one last uh, thought, which is uh, another way of approaching the PDA to get better efficacy. Maybe this is what we need to do. And this is already a med medication available for treatment of fever and and pain in older children and, and adults. And it may be that a double action for PDA treatment is the way we need to go. So with that, I'd like to um, show you a nice uh, Sydney sunset. And uh, I'm quite happy to answer any questions or I'd be interested in your thoughts about some of these thoughts about the current perspective of the PDA in 2020. Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Professor uh, Martin. It's a really a thought provoking. So uh, I received a few questions. And as you uh, talk about therapeutic nihilism and personalized medicine, so there is a one question. What do you do in your unit? <laughs> Well, I showed, I showed that we're more in the target. We're one step before the um, therapeutic nihilism. We're still at the targeted treatment. So we still believe that there are babies who benefit from early treatment. And okay. we use a combination of clinical screening and um, ultrasound screening. So very premature babies under 25 weeks who okay. are on a mechanical ventilator uh, mm -hmm. who may have significant RDS, not received antenatal steroids. Mm -hmm. We do an ultrasound. We see that they have a large PDA, unconstricted, and particularly if they have early evidence of systemic to pulmonary steel, reverse yeah. flow in the descending aorta and diastole, that baby we would try and give treatment for in the first 6 to 12 hours because we would okay. like to try and prevent IVH and pulmonary hemorrhage, and we know mm -hmm. that there is evidence that early treatment will do that. Uh, yeah. And we also feel the efficacy is better. And also, mm -hmm. interestingly, side effects are less in mm -hmm. the first few days of life. So our aim is to identify a, a high-risk group of babies and give them treatment early. Then mm -hmm. there's, after that, we're not so fussed. Older babies, 26, 27 weeks on CPAP, we tend to just monitor and see that the duct's starting to constrict and we don't mm -hmm. treat those babies routinely, only if they're mm -hmm. special circumstances. And you use uh, ibuprofen or paracetamol? Or? Ibuprofen in the, well, in fact, I use indomethacin um, that's still available for us. So I use indomethacin in the first place for treatment. Mm 
uh, in, okay. the first, uh, mm-hmm. in the first week of life. My preference is into medicine because the data supports IVH and pulmonary hemorrhage prevention. After mm-hmm. the first week of life, I use ibuprofen. Oh. And paracetamol is our second line drug if non-steroidals fail. Okay, uh, there is uh, one, uh, there are two questions uh, related, uh, actually related to each other. Is uh, what is the role of pro BNP in monitoring hemodynamic caused by the PDA? So I think pro BNP does have some um, utility, but it's problematic in some ways. First, first problem is many of the studies have shown a huge variability in the normals of pro BNP, so it's a bit hard to know what the normal is or what abnormal is. The okay. second thing is that I think um, pro-BNP is often a later effect from the PDA. It's not there at the beginning, but when we start to get yeah. dilatation of the heart, then we start to get changes in pro-BNP. So I think it's okay. useful as a monitoring uh, to see that it's getting better as you're treating the PDA, but it's more difficult to use it as a decision point tool. Okay. One question, Martin, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, there yes. was a question is uh, from one of the viewers that can we classify a PDA whether it is significant or not based on diameter and LA ratio if otherwise child is asymptomatic? Yes, so that so I, there's a couple of things there. It's an asymptomatic child but has an, a large, uh, or we, can we then use the ductal size or diameter? plus or minus the LA aortic ratio to assess hemodynamic significance. So I think it's getting more complicated. When we first, the first thing that we were interested in was ductal diameter, and we've used that for many years, but I agree with others who have, who have criticised that to say that's too simplistic. So I think what we now are interested in is we need to have increased diameter, but also evidence of a left to right shunt of significant volume. And we assess that by multiple parameters, looking at the systemic side and the pulmonary side. So typically I would use four things, PDA diameter, the flow pattern in the duct, because if there's evidence yeah. of ductal constriction, there will be uh, a flow pattern which is different to one with a wide open PDA. I look at the flow of blood in the diastole and the descending aorta for evidence of systemic steel. And I look at the left pulmonary artery diastolic velocity. And all, if all four of those things are positive on my parameters, that baby, I think, has got a hemodynamically significant PDA and I would treat. But I would also look at the clinical context. So I, I might still give a baby the benefit of the doubt if it was 28 weeks and had all those things. Whilst it was 23 or 24 weeks, I would definitely treat. The LA aortic ratio is a little bit problematic because I feel it's not very useful in the first few days because it takes some time for the heart to dilate with a big shunt. And the second problem is that the PFO acts as a decompression device. So babies who have a very big or large PFO, even if they have a large duct, the left atrium just decompresses across the PFO and we don't get a, an increased LA aortic ratio. So there are some limitations of the LA aortic ratio in some babies. Okay, so there's uh, another question if I have time, uh, Rajesh. Uh, yeah, there are yeah. actually two questions. Yeah. Is there any time, Rajesh, we can ask? We have two, three minutes. Okay. Two, three minutes, okay. So there is a, uh, one question about that. Can treating the PDA in extreme premature uh, uh, babies uh, worsen the PPH? And I think uh, he or she is talking about the prophylactic treatment. Uh, yes. Yes, and it's a good question because uh, a number of the prophylactic PDA, well, the ibuprofen trial anyway, was stopped. The very early uh, prophylactic ibuprofen trial was stopped because of concerns of pulmonary hypertension. So yeah. we always do a, an ultrasound uh, because we can do them ourselves um, before we treat a baby. And if a baby has a significant right to left component of their ductal shunt, then we will delay treatment and reassess the baby at a later point. So yes, it is possible to close a PDA in a baby who has raised pulmonary hair pressures with significant right to left shunt, and that can cause an acute decompensation of a baby from a pulmonary point of view. So we would recommend always doing an ultrasound to screen for significant right to left shunt prior to treatment. Even in, prof- in the so-called prophylactic approach, what we're sure. really doing is we're actually doing early targeted, and that means doing an ultrasound 
as well, and sure. then you don't have that problem. Yeah. Okay. So there, there's one uh, interesting question, last question because of the time. I we I have a few more, but uh, I think you cover everything. So this is the question because uh, I think the participant uh, is more excited about your personalized medicine way of management. So they said if there is any um, uh, a special marker, uh, you know, you already answer about the BNP, but is there, is there any other biomarkers you are using it? Not that I'm using, but there are other people looking at many different things. And I think it's oh, going okay. to be, including the genetics. Yeah, the genetics oh, okay. of the PDA yeah. is very interesting. There are some babies who may respond better to non steroidals, some babies mm -hmm. who may respond better to paracetamol, um, some babies who will never respond. So mm -hmm. I think. This is really what my idea is and my feeling is that we need to spend more time looking at these parameters. We should throw the net wide, look mm -hmm. at many different things, and then we should then try and rationalise these into what groups of babies, what risk factors babies have, and then treat babies even with different medications at different time points. So that's what personalised medicine is, and we're moving towards that in many other parameters. I mean, in hypotension management, and choice of inotrope, we need to be more um, personalised and not algorithmic. Um, we need to understand the physiology. And I think, um, so I think there are many potential markers. And um, I mean, I, I, wrote an, I wrote an article with Petra Lemmers a couple of years ago, and we looked at non-ultrasound ways of assessing the PDA. And there were about 50 of them, including oh, okay. plate, yeah. platelet count, for example, has some okay. relationship. There are, there are many interesting things that can be used to assess the PDA even beyond ultrasound. And I think we need to start trying to understand them and bringing them together and then yeah. saying this particular baby would respond best to this, this baby would respond best to another form of treatment. So. Yeah. One question. Oh, okay. The trap uh, sorry. <laughs> Interesting one. Uh, nowadays, because of the, a lot of people are going towards paracetamol, so question is, if a baby has been given a course of paracetamol and it fails to close the PDA, can you switch over to ibuprofen? And the second part is, can the two be given together also? Well, that was the aim of my last slide, of course, because that was exactly <laughs> what it, that was. There, right. is a, there is a preparation that we give our children already in Australia, which yeah. has got a combination of ibuprofen and paracetamol. And so my, I was initially concerned about giving those two drugs together. Has anybody on the panel given those two drugs together at the same time? Ibuprofen and oh. paracetamol? You know, only for fever, alternate. <laughs> alternate, but not together. No, not together. Not yes, together. I, was, I was worried if we did that, I might do something really bad to the baby to give them, you know, the two pair oxygenase and co-oxygenase inhibitor both together. Yeah. But then I looked and my, one of my daughters uh, showed me this medicine and she said, I'm taking this for my fever. I said, oh my goodness, it's the both already combined together. So it can't be that bad. So yeah. maybe it's okay uh, to give to a neonate. Um, so that was, so I think, yes, it's okay to, if paracetamol fails to go straight to ibuprofen. And the question is, should we, using, should we be using both together? And would that actually increase our efficacy rates? And I, I've seen a couple of case reports of dual treatment but nobody has done a clinical trial on that. So there's an idea for you. But, but, but my problem is that, that if the efficacy of both medicines are the same, then how one can better than it's just a trial and error, you know, the new Hippocratic Different mechanisms. Said. Different mechanism. Yeah. So it's Different additive. mechanism, yeah, exactly. Yeah. One, so one works at one end of the, uh, one's co-oxygenase, yes. one's peroxidase. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's, it's, it's having an effect at two different points in the prostaglandin uh, pathway. So I think it goes towards your point of genetic and the genetics bio, uh, biomarkers. Yeah. That some, yeah, exactly. So, that's, so it's yeah. important to understand that a little bit more because I think going back and, and meta-analyzing 20-year-old trials and then trying to say that, they, that, that the treatments don't work, I, I can't see the point in doing that anymore. I mean, it's served yeah. its purpose. We need to move on now from that and say, okay, we all know that there are a small group of babies who benefit from getting treatment or prophylaxis from IVH or pulmonary hemorrhage. Let's identify those babies. And there's also definitely a group of babies who go on in the nursery and just get sicker and sicker. They're, they go into heart failure and eventually they get ligated at five weeks or six weeks. Can we identify that baby earlier and yeah. give them catheter treatment for example uh, and I think that catheter occlusion device will make a big 
difference in the future because that's potentially able to be done at the bedside with an image intensifier. And it's, it's very efficacious and seems to have very little risk. So I'm, this, it's being decided at the moment the role of the, the occluder. It's not something that everybody's using by any means and it still needs some research. But I think it's an exciting new development uh, that will make a difference to our management in sure. the next few years. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I okay. think we yeah. have to wrap up now. I'm sure we can continue discussion throughout the night as well. <laughs> uh, there's so much of interest. Uh, but uh, we need to get in Dr. Monica Oshan. I think she does not need any introduction in UAE and across the world as well. So, Monica, can you please take over and introduce our next speakers and auditors? Thank you, Dr. Junaid. For thank you. Uh, I, I, I would like to thank Dr. Martin Kulako. Thank you very much uh, for his uh, beautiful um, lecture and the discussion and very thought provoking. So, thank you, uh, all the team. Uh, over to Monica. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really an enlightening uh, talk, Dr. Martin. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, the next uh, moderator, Dr. Hisham. He's a consultant, uh, neonatal, uh, perinatal medicine uh, in uh, Cornish Hospital, one of the biggest unit. Uh, uh, at the moment in Abu Dhabi, and uh, he has a lot of interest in um, uh, ventilation, and um, and also like uh, he's uh, uh, running a fellowship program for the uh, neonatology there. So, uh, Dr. Hisham, please. It's my pleasure to introduce. You. Thank you, Monica. For the introduction, it's uh, really a pleasure to be with you uh, tonight. And uh, now I have the privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Vineet Bandari. Uh, Dr. Bandari has really an impressive and long CV, which is really hard to summarize in a few lines, but I'll do my best job here. Uh, Dr. Bandari is an American board certified doctor in both uh, pediatrics and neonatal perinatal medicine. is currently the division head of the neonatal perinatal medicine of Children Hospital at Cooper at Camden, uh, New Jersey. And he's also a professor of pediatrics at Cooper Medical School, Rawan University. Uh, he is a member of uh, the editorial board of many medical journals. Uh, he authored several books. Among them is the famous book, The Manual of Neonatology. And uh, he has numerous publications tackling uh, the respiratory system, uh, specifically the chronic lung disease. Dr. No. Bandari will talk to us today of, uh, to prevent and treat chronic lung disease. Dr. Bandari. Can everyone please uh, mute themselves so that you know we can uh, hear uh, clearly about the lecture here? Thank you, Hasham, uh, for the nice introduction. Um, I'm uh, very uh, pleased and honored to have this uh, invitation from the NFIUA chapter, and I'm happy to be um, doing my lecture. Now, I'm going to try to see if I can um, get to do the sharing of the screen, which has been, I've not been able to do it as yet. Um, Uh, you will be seeing the uh, down the share screen. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not uh, able to see that. Uh, let me see if I can. I had the same problem yesterday also. Yeah, let me see if I can share the screen. Let's see. All right. Share. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. We can. Okay. All right. So I'm going to see if I can move the slide. This. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to start my talk now. Uh, hopefully, all of you can hear me okay and see me okay too. Uh, my talk is on uh, ventilator management to prevent and treat bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, 
So I think well, the first thing I want to do is to basically start with the definition because um, sometimes there is some confusion about what I'm talking about when I talk about the outcomes. Um, while the clinical definition is uh, what we routinely use and it's probably not the best definition because you're using a therapeutic modality, a treatment process to define a disease process, the definition of a disease. And so that can potentially become problematic. Um, but um, I think it is a, quite a practical definition and the lecture I'm going to give or a talk I'm going to give is going to be a practical um, a be, uh, talk. So I think it will be useful for, for this purposes. So focusing primarily on the babies who are less than 32 weeks because that's pretty much the babies who actually get BPD. In fact, if you have babies in your unit who are more than 1,250 grams and more than 32 weeks and still getting more than, let's say, 5% BPD rate in those babies, uh, then something needs to be done or looked at closely in your unit because that gestation at that age should not really be requiring uh, getting, you know, getting into BPD uh, status. So for babies at less than 32 weeks, the first thing you have to look at is has the baby been treated um, for more than room air for at least 28 days. Now, this assessment is done at 36 weeks, uh, post-menstrual age or discharge, whichever comes first. But keep in mind, um, when we talk about 28 days plus, we are talking about cumulative 28 days. It doesn't have to be consecutive, but cumulative. So anytime the oxygen has been used, supplemental oxygen has been used for more than 28 days over the first till the baby is 36 weeks of uh, postmenstrual age, then they can be um, they can be used for um, uh, they can be assessed at that point, and then you make a diagnosis of BPD. So if you are breathing in room air at 36 weeks postmenstrual age, and you've received supplemental oxygen for at least 28 days plus, then you call that mild BPD. If you are requiring less than 30% oxygen, you're considered moderate BPD. And if you're requiring more than equal to 30% oxygen or you're requiring positive pressure support. Now by that, I also include nasal CPAP as well as nasal IPPV, nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation. So you could be in room air um, with getting nasal CPAP at, um, um, at 36 weeks of postmenstrual age, uh, but you would be considered to have severe BPD. Now there is, uh, um, there is some uh, assessment done at 36 weeks where folks have tried to differentiate between the severe BPD into type 1 and type 2. And I will talk a little bit more in detail about that as we go through the talk. And essentially what the type 1 is including those requiring 30% or greater than 30% or nasal cannula or CPAP. And type 2 is a more severe variety of the severe BPD where you are essentially you are on long-term mechanical invasive me uh, ventilation. How does BPD happen? Now, this is a very simplified way of doing, of understanding the pathogenesis of BPD, but I think as an initial point to at least get the, um, some idea of how the B BPD happens, I think is very useful. One of the first things I want to mention is about the genetic factors. We had published this paper way back in 2006, and it has been independently confirmed a couple of years later, that the genetic factors um, do contribute somewhere probably around 60 to 80%, so let's use around number of around 70%, um, where uh, th they are contributing to the baby getting BPD. It is not just a simple old genetic factor, it's a combination of genetic factors as well as environmental factors that lead you to get to have BPD. The environmental factors include ventilator trauma, and this is primarily focusing on invasive ventilation. The ventilator trauma could be due to biotrauma, electrotrauma, volume trauma, barotrauma, however you want to assess it. But essentially, the fact that you have an invasive foreign body inside the airway essentially, uh, um, essentially um, incites an inflammatory process and then we go down from there. Infection is also an important player for this inflammatory process. Infection could be antenatal, which is obviously chorionitis, or it could be postnatal. Now, when I talk about, when I'm talking about postnatal infection, I'm meaning not only the fact that you could get a systemic infection, whether it's um, a blood culture proven infection or suspected infection or uh, or also could be a localized infection in, only in the lungs. So that all of that can lead to also an inflammatory response. And finally, uh, hyperoxia, exposure to higher concentration of oxygen in a baby that has a limited antioxidant defense system leads to a situation where there is um, an increased release of reactive oxygen species, which leads to, um, again, the same inflammatory process. So a combination of genetic and environmental factors lead to an inflammatory process start uh, initiating in the lung and remaining persistent 
for it to get into the BPD situation. Keep in mind that there is um, uh, RDS, or which is respiratory distress syndrome or surfactant deficiency, which used to be classically associated with BPD is not necessary. And you will notice that I've put a plus minus in front of surfactant deficiency, but these babies with RDS may or may not have a surfactant deficiency. You have babies who seem to do reasonably well on CPAP for some degree, or some supplemental oxygen and do fine, don't even get surfactant, but over the next few days to weeks develop um, a need for increasing oxygen requirement and put, potentially also requiring invasive ventilation. So all these factors lead to, lead to an inflammatory process and, uh, and the process of cell death. And then the body has to try to uh, res resolve this injury or try to repair it. If it resolves this injury, and there's a variety of factors that are responsible for resolution, it could be in um, nutrition, uh, stem cell factors, and lots of other factors that could be playing a role, growth factors. Uh, and then of course, hopefully you have a decent lung um, that continues to grow and remain healthy. However, if this resolution does not happen, and you are dealing with impaired alveolarization and dysregulated vascularization happens. These are very classic pathological um, appearances of the lung when the baby gets PPD. So impaired alveolarization ref refers to large simplified alveoli that obviously does not have enough lung tissue, which is obviously going to affect your lung blood gas exchange. Now I want to make a point about dysregulated vascularization. Uh, so yes, there is less number of lung tissue, amount of lung tissue, so you would expect to have less number of blood vessels because they go along with the lining of the lung tissue. However, there are areas of lung tissue where there is excessive formation of blood vessels. And, and, and so it is dysregulated, not necessarily always decreased. And there's some very nice work done by Monique Pepe from Brown University, where she has published this work that you have areas in the lung that is proliferating, have proliferating blood vessels, but these are, blood vessels are not normal. They are, um, they are not normally appearing and normally do not have the single layers or the, you know, the layer that will allow the blood, get, blood gas exchange to happen. So these are the two major uh, pathological hallmarks of PPD. And that's, uh, that's the one that you would call uh, as PPD when you see it on a say, lung tissue slide. Let me go a little bit more into, into um, description of their mechanical ventilation situation. So when you have a baby who's getting mechanically ventilated, and obviously I'm focusing primarily on invasive ventilation, you have a situation there's excessive tidal volume, more oxygen, and we have talked about infection, and of course, patent dextroarteries may or may not play a role. Um, this is a little bit of a controversial issue, especially when you're dealing with flooding of the lung or excessive fluid intake, but it is still an important factor if you are leading to pulmonary edema. And so, um, Essentially, if you have volume trauma, oxygen toxicity, and inflammatory mediators, all of this leads to uh, acute lung injury inflammatory response. And once you have the inflammatory response, you have airway damage, you have vascular injury, and of course, interstitial damage. And these are highlighted over here. And all of these processes of damaging of the lung leads to airway obstruction, pulmonary edema, and in some situations, pulmonary hypertension. But I want to highlight the fact that there is minimal fibrosis in this classic new BPD appearance. And, if, and we do continue to show large simplified alveoli with dysregulated blood vessels, and that's how you get BPD. This is a much more um, uh, attractive um, uh, uh, cartoon of uh, how the lung develops BPD. And, and here, the main point to highlight is the fact that your lung needs to be in the late canalicular stage or the early saccular stage, and that is what is the one that is most likely to get into BPD. If you have a more mature lung, as you see over here, um, it is unlikely if you do practice neonatology the way it is done nowadays, that they would get into PPD. And so this baby, um, if you get the fact and potentially you have less amount of uh, lung damage, but still you do get inflammation and vascular pro problematic problems with the vascular development as well as for simplified alveoli. When you have prolonged invasive ventilation, you can get actually even more injury, especially because of the fact that it's invasive, you can get areas of atelectasis, um, alternating with areas of cystic formation. And I will highlight those points when we talk about severe BPD down the line. Uh, there is acute and chronic inflammation. Uh, in the old BPD format, there used to be a lot more fibrosis, but we are much more aware of the damages, if the damaging effect of invasive ventilation. And so we try to avoid uh, keeping that going for a long time. Uh, this basically tries to highlight some of the biomarkers or inflammatory agents that are involved in this process. Um, they are, these are these prenatal factors, hypoxia, infection, smoking, lack of steroid, genetic susceptibility, and congenital 
um, anomalies that lead to an immature lung, and then you have this mechanical ventilation hyperoxia, the two major environmental factors leading to these increased levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines into leukin 6, HT, NF-alpha, and some other cytokines, TGF-beta, MCP, CXCL1, TNF-alpa, uh, angiopoietin 2, um, and that leads to an aberrant tissue repair, which in, in interferes with the vascular and alveolar development, leading to new BPD. This is highlighting the fact that um, infection is also an important player in this process. And so you see that there is maternal chorium rhinitis, and obviously there is an inflammation and infection occurring, and it can obviously go to the lung and the systemic. And so if you have a situation where there is evidence of infection in the baby antenatally or postnatally, you are going to be landing up in a situation where you might require prolonged invasive mechanical uh, ventilation and a poor response to surfactant therapy. A combination of invasive mechanical ventilation and sepsis in an immature lung situation, you are going to be more likely to get PPD. I'm going to show you some um, classic pictures of BPD, um, just so that we are on the same page. Um, these are, they have, uh, folks have decided to separate our BPD into four stages. Um, and uh, I personally usually don't like to use these stages of BPD because they don't really give me a time frame. And I will give you a, a classification that I, I developed or I use, uh, and maybe that would be more helpful to you. So this is stage one BPD, which shows a diffuse reticular granular appearance. You can see this very nice air bronchograms, low lung volume, and you can see there is not much of a cardiothermic um, silhouette. There's really not much differentiation between the heart and the lung because of the atelectasis in a surfactant deficient lung. This is indistinguishable from RDS, and so this is considered stage one, or, and it could last for days to weeks. Uh, well, not really weeks, probably last for hours to days, and most of the uh, times we are giving surfactant here so that uh, process gets uh, changed. This is stage two of BPD. There is homogeneous opacification of lung fields with coarse confluent uh, density. You can see in this situation, there is actually overexpansion of the lung. And this can last again for days to weeks. Then there's the stage three, where you can start seeing some changes in the lung, where you see the cystic lucencies over here and bilaterally. And I'm going to show you a CT scan of this kind of a lung later on to make it even more prominent. And finally, we have stage four, where you have this bubbly appearance in cysts in some places. You have this uh, decreased lung volumes, and there's potentially some increased interstitial markings and potentially some fibrosis going on. And obviously, you will appreciate the fact that these lungs are not looking healthy at all. And there's going to be a lot of difficulty in maintaining uh, ventilation and oxygenation in these lungs. Uh, and these, are, these babies are very challenging to manage. And I will try to give you some suggestions of how we do that. So, if you want to try and prevent uh, BPD, uh, the management strategy actually starts in the delivery room, and so at soon after birth. Um, this is from a, a chapter of the book we wrote for, which is uh, mentioned over here on the left. This is published in December 2018. Of course, uh, the chapter was written, you know, almost a year before that. Uh, at that point, there were some data suggesting that sustained lung inflation might be helpful in these preterm babies, but um, I think the current um, consensus is that there is no evidence to support the use of sustained lung in inflation uh, based on the uh, data that is there in the Cochrane Database Review, which includes the largest study done on that, uh, which is the SAIL file. So I suppose um, the next iteration of this chapter, this is going to get removed. But that being said, I think it is important that you have to recruit some FRC, but you do not have to give a large rec for a longer period of time, because that potentially can lead to too much of an expansion of the lung and lead to uh, lung uh, initiation of lung damage. So once you recruit uh, the initial foes, then uh, what we tend to do is we like to use CPAP. Um, sometimes um, if a baby requires some NIPPV, which is nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation, we also do that in certain circumstances. Um, I don't have synchronized NIPPV anymore, um, so I just do NIPPV. Um, we follow uh, insure processes, in other words, if the baby is requiring more oxygen, we will intubate and give surfactant and take the tube out very quickly. If we do that, we always extubate to NIPPV. So that's, that is standard. So do not, we do not extubate to CPAP. We always extubate to NIPPV as we have enough data, and this has been shown by Cochrane Review too, that using NIPPV seems to be better in trying to decrease the amount of injury that will happen to the lung. Now, the criteria for giving surfactant, we have a very low threshold. Um, and if I find a baby on CPAP of say six, uh, and if the baby is going from 25 to 30% oxygen on that, I will intubate and give surfactant. And keep in mind that the older, the older uh, 
um, benchmark for giving surfactant, you, they used to use the cutoff value of 40%, but that cutoff value was based on oxygen requirement on an oxy hood or a head box, not on positive pressure. So when you're dealing with positive pressure, you're definitely going to have some expansion of the lung, which will allow you um, the oxygen requirement to come down. So you have to be careful that you wait, do not wait too long to give this, ox, uh, this surfactant. Uh, we tend to give it early, like I just mentioned, and we try our best to give it within the first two hours of life. If the baby required intubation for resuscitation in the DR, we, would give, we will give surfactant. And if the baby is ready for it, we will then extubate uh, the baby to NIPPV. Um, we do have criteria. If suppose the baby required intubation and ventilation for some time, and we have given surfactant, but we're not ready to extubate because the baby's um, clinical picture does not allow us to do it, then we do have specific criteria. When these certain settings are reached, we will then be able to um, extubate the baby to NIPTV. There are various modes of ventilation um, that you can try in babies. Uh, these are a few modes that we use uh, for um, pressure ventilation. And I will talk about what we, most of the time, what we are doing now in our unit is volume targeted ventilation or volume ventilation. Now, IMV is your classic uh, pressure uh, control um, intermittent mandatory ventilation. And you can see the patient breath is the one in the dark spots over here. And this is the ventilator breath that you see um, like this shark fin. Um, in synchronized, and most of the time, almost always, if you are doing IMV, we will use synchronized mode. And the flow sensor is there in the endotracheal tube. And you can see that each and every breath that the ventilator is giving is synchronized with the patient's breath. Assist control is when we are assisting each and every spontaneous breath of the baby and reaching up to the pressure that we have already put into the ventilator. Pressure control, pressure support is that we give, so we allow the baby to breathe on his or her own, and then in certain, uh, whatever number we are setting for the rate, we will help the baby breathe a little bit better in the sense that we will support the extra amount uh, to reach the, the particular pressure that we are aiming for, and that would be pressure support. Um, as I've mentioned, we don't, we have moved for the last couple of years from pressure ventilation to volume targeted ventilation, and I'll talk a little bit more detail in about that in a few minutes. Uh, just to give you some important methods of improving oxygenation, and uh, this is a nice cartoon which uh, summarizes this. So one can, of course, then increase PEEP, which is over here. You can increase the PIEP. You can increase the eye time. You can increase the rate, which will shorten the distance between these two breaths. And of course, you can increase the FiO2. There is always a balance between trying to do these changes in pressure mode and oxygen, uh, because both of them are going to be damaging potentially. Um, I tend to use for the oxygen requirements, I tend to use what I call the 40, 60, 80 rule. Uh, and there is data in the animal world, in our, and we have done it too, and we have published this work, that between room air and 40%, you're pretty much okay in the sense that the amount of damage that's going to be happening to the lung is within, within the minimal limit you can think of. Um, and you know, if you need to give it, you need to give it. Uh, once you reach 60%, 60 you're going to start getting more damage. And once you reach 80%, you're going to create more severe damage. Um, Beyond 80%, it's about the same. So if you're using 80 or 100 or 90, it's about the same. So once you reach 80, um, the effort, to, you know, if it goes higher than that, it doesn't really make that big a difference in some of the injury for parameters that we have measured. But the effort should be to try to keep the oxygen at around 80 or 60 or 40 as much as possible. So I try to balance what I'm trying to achieve in terms of the damage due to the invasive ventilation, barrel trauma, volume trauma, whatever you want to use the terminology, and the FI2 requirement. So if I find the FO2 requirement has gone up to 60% and my pressure, the mean air pressure I'm using is relatively on the lower end, then I will increase the mean air pressure, in mean air pressure by using one of these parameters and then see if I can get the FO2 down to about 40%. I try my very best when we are ventilating and managing these babies that we try to keep the FO2 to somewhere around 40% or lower um, if at all possible. If you want to improve the ventilation, by that I mean wash out, washing out the CO2, you can increase the rate, you can increase the tidal volume, you can increase the PIP, and, or you can decrease the PIP, PIP, because if you increase the PIP too much, you're going to cause some um, stacking of the bread, so to speak, and allow CO2 retention to happen. You can also increase the eye time to allow um, the CO2 to be washed out. But you have to be careful. If you're going to manipulate the eye, eye time, you have to also be careful about the E time, because the I to E ratio is a very critical amount, is a critical factor when you're trying to uh, get rid of uh, CO2. Um, normally, when we are breathing, our ratio to I to E is about one to two. Um, and if you try to make it less than that, you will not give enough time for the baby to be breathing out. 
uh, in our pressure mode of ventilation, remember what we are doing is we are doing an active form of inhalation or inspiration, but a passive form of expiration. So you have to give enough time for the CO2 to be washed out. If you allow, if you do not are uh, not careful and you have a shorter E time or the ratio becomes one is to two or even reverses, which is obviously not physiological, what's going to happen is you're going to cause air trapping and inverted, inadvertent peep, and that is not going to be good, not only because of the fact that it causes expansion of the lung or has pressure on the, um, on the lung uh, volumes and increases much more or stretches it much more than it should be, but also the stacking of the breath with increasing peep, what's going to happen is you're going to be actually retaining CO2 and it'll defeat the purpose for washing out the CO2. This is just a summary of uh, what to do when you have uh, uh, adjustments to ventilators based on blood gas analysis. You have low PO2 or high PO2, PACO2, you can increase peak pressure and even might sometimes may also work by increasing the rate. Um, if you have, a, for example, I'm just picking up some normal PO2 and high PACO2, you decrease PEEP, increase rate, keep MAP constant. PO2 normal, low PO2, PACO2, decrease the rate, maintain mean air pressure. These are pretty much hopefully uh, something practical points that you have learned or you are learning while you are doing the ventilatory process of managing these babies. One of the things I want to mention is that if the no, you have normal values, um, you don't really have to uh, necessarily sit tight, um, but also focus on weaning the baby. Because the effort should be that every time you have a baby on invasive mechanical ventilation, that uh, effort has to be made to try and get the tube out. And I will be focusing a lot on that as we go through this talk. So I like to distinguish, um, I, I try to use the early evolving and established phase of BPD. This is something that we published uh, way back in 2009, I think. And I find it easier to use this um, classification because it just gives me a time frame to, of, for working at. So early phase of BPD is from birth to one week of life. Evolving is from seven days, one week of life to 36 weeks post mental age and established phase is beyond 36 weeks. Um, so um, it, it is, pretty much something that I use from the fact that I can time what I'm trying to do because the effort is to try to see if I can make changes in the early phase to try and prevent the damaging effect of the evolving and established phase. And if I have already reached the evolving and established phase of ventilation and I'm still invasively mechanically ventilated, ventilating the baby, what can I do to make it better or at least decrease the severity of the disease? So these are the parameters that uh, I tend to use. So these are your eye times. Uh, keep in mind, if you're going to use a lower eye time, you will have to use a higher rate. Um, and if you use a higher eye time, you'll have to use a lower rate to make sure that your eye to E ratios are balanced and your CO2 is getting washed out properly. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we tend to use volume ventilation. And these are the numbers that we usually aim for around three to six ml per kilogram. Um, I tend not to use high peeps. I tend to stop around six or seven, except when I'm dealing with severe BPD, which is, I would say, um, you know, a much, it is part of the established phase of BPD, but uh, those babies are much older and they behave somewhat differently. And I will be talking about the severe BPD uh, babies a little bit later, and we'll be using much higher peeps on those babies. And these are our recommended pressure support values, uh, pressure support for babies based on their birth weight, six to eight for less than 1,000 grams, uh, eight to 10 for 1,000, 1,500 grams, and 10 to 12 for more than 1,500 grams. The blood gas targets. The blood gas targets I tend to use is pH 7.25 to 7.35. In other words, I'm very happy if the baby has a pH of 7.25, I don't go about pushing it at a higher level. PaO2 40 to 60, PaCO2 45 to 55. Remember, this is early phase, um, so in the first few days of life, uh, and this is PaCO2. So with the, if you're using a capillary gas, you can probably let it go to 60, 65, um, because there is about a five to 10 millimeter of mercury difference. Um, but Try not to push the ventilator settings too much higher to get into what we would consider the lower end of the normal here uh, because the effort should be, can I get the tube out? So this is, gives you a cartoon of uh, some possible scenarios of how a baby moves from, uh, from birth to the first few days of life uh, to mild, moderate, and severe BPD. So ideally, what we would like is the baby comes out, um, you put a baby on CPAP or an IPPV and you know, give insure get the tube out, and then hopefully you can keep the baby on NIPPV. And it becomes very critical if you can keep the baby out of, uh, out of without the tube in the first few days of life. And even though when, we, when I did the classification of early phase, I say seven days, but uh, over time what I found is it is actually the first three days of life that seem to be very critical. In fact, there is a paper that we've looked, published where we talked about the timing 
uh, and, and the PPD when it happens or when it initiates. And the data seems to suggest that the first 24 hours, you can potentially keep the baby intubated and does not seem to make that big a difference. But what is happening between the 24 mark, hour mark and 72 hour mark makes a bigger difference in terms of the longer term outcome in terms of PPD. What we have suggested is that if you can keep the, if you can extubate the baby and keep the tube out, you will probably modify the inflammatory process to enough an extent that even if the baby gets reintubated later on, and this is very critical, you should not be scared of taking the tube out just because you think the baby might need intubation on day four or day five, or say two weeks later, if the baby gets some inflammatory process like infection or NEC. Because we have published this data, um, there is independent data from Leif Nellin's group in Nationwide Children. Um, there's a, another third paper that's been published from the CHOP uh, Triplani's group, essentially saying the same thing, that the fear of reintubation should not stop you from extubating the baby if you are reaching the purple settings and you're comfortable um, with extubating the baby. The, there is data suggesting that, and human data as well as animal data, suggesting that the response to the same degree of injury between putting the tube in and putting some pressure and oxygen is different in the first few days of life as compared to what happens down the line. So if you are able to interrupt, modify this inflammatory process in the first few days of life, you may be able to get away with more lung injury, even if you intubate later, because at that point, later on, a few days of life or weeks of life, the lung is more mature and perhaps the systems in place to manage or to respond to these kind of injurious agents have matured enough that they can handle it and they can go towards the resolution of lung injury rather than towards the repair of lung injury. Um, and uh, there's a very nice paper by Lavoy et al. in General of Pediatrics where he talks about the cytokine response in the first few days of life and the immune response and how they are different compared to say day one to two versus day four to seven or five to seven. Uh, it might be worthwhile for you to look into that. However, in this scenario over here, if you are unable to extubate or you reintubate very early in the first few days of life, a few hours of life, you might be requiring more pressures. You might get into air leaks and get into high frequency oscillation as a respiratory therapy. And these babies are, are prone or are at risk for getting severe BPD. Uh, if you are able to modify it by vent volume ventilation and keep the mean airway pressure low in the first few days of life, you might be able to get away and get to moderate PPD. These are the extubation settings. So if you have intubated the baby and you have not done insure, which means immediately extubate the baby, but you want to try and keep the baby intubated for some time, again, I would strongly recommend that you try to be very aggressive and try to reach these settings of 25, 16 over 5, so using pressure ventilation and F5 to around 35%. And if you reach those settings, you know, go ahead and extubate uh, because we have found good success rate. Uh, extubating to NIPPV, uh, what we have reported, and there's been multiple studies on this and there's often reviews on this, uh, the success rate of keeping a tube extubated in the first week of life, once you reach these settings, is close to 90, 94%. Um, compared to, let's say, if you extubate to CPAP, when the extubation rate is around, uh, success rate is 60%. If you take, if our first study where we actually even followed these babies up till they got home or got, got or discharged from the NICU, the success rate remained sustained at 88%. So extubating a baby once you reach these lower settings to NIPPV it definitely is much better uh, in terms of the outcomes, uh, lung outcomes compared to extubating them to CPAP. If you're in the evolving phase of BPD, here the other factors come into play. Um, once again, if you have reasons uh, to reintubate the baby, but you can still try to extubate the baby in the first, after a first week of life, the chances are there that you can get into uh, potentially mild BPD or avoid getting BPD altogether. However, if you get complicated with pneumonias or the PDA stays open, there's flooding of the lungs, and you've tried all the conservative management and you cannot treat for whatever reason, and you're needing higher pressures, then the chances are likely that you would get into moderate to severe BPD. So the the, so keeping the airway clear, so in terms of getting rid of the tube, uh, is of course very, very important, but it's also important to try to decrease the risk of infection. So I talked about pneumonia over here, which of course is increased with the fact that the tube is in place, but there is clapsy there, there is systemic onset infection there. So if you can try to put in procedures in place to decrease clapsy in your unit, the central line associated blood stream infection, you will also make an impact in decreasing BPD. This has been um, also been well uh, described. In the evolving phase of BPD, I tend to use the same pH, I tend to allow the PO2 to be a little bit on the higher side and also allow a little bit of permissive hypercapnia. 
In the established phase of BPD, this is very challenging. It is very difficult. Obviously, you've now already had BPD. And the question is, can you try to make an impact to make, decrease the severity of BPD? Um, one can try, um, but if a baby is had has moderate or severe BPD, the baby is at risk of family hypertension. As a general rule, uh, we screen our babies at around 36 weeks post, post menstrual age for family hypertension. And if the baby is, is gut, has family hypertension and is on respiratory support, we will treat it. Um, and this is very important. And this has been evolving over the last three to five years. And what we have found is that if you delay too long or you wait till they, you know, we have babies who come home, come to us on like five liters of nasal candle or 30% oxygen and everybody is very comfortable. And they come to us because somebody picked up an ROP and they wanted us to treat it in our regional center. And, and we find that when we go and echo in these babies, they have florid pulmonary hypertension, uh, which has not been managed. And then any little small, you know, infection or something else uh, uh, event basically puts them across the edge and they go into florid pulmonary hypertension. And then we are running around putting them on the oscillator, nitric oxide. Uh, and, you know, some, sometimes these are very difficult babies to manage. So I would highly recommend that you have, especially if you have moderate to severe BPD babies, around 36 weeks of post menstrual age, please do an echo to rule out pulmonary hypertension because the management of these babies uh, is very challenging if you wait too long. In the established phase of BPD, we would use pH of 7.25 and 7.35. The PaO2 is 50 to 70 and PaCO2 is 50 to 65 <coughs> mmHg. And again, allowing the permissive hypercapnia and we'll talk about saturation ranges and targets in a few minutes. I told you that I would show you a picture of a CT scan of a baby with severe BPD, and you can see the cystic lesion on the plain X-ray, but obviously the CT scan is very dramatic, and you can uh, imagine that it's very difficult to uh, oxygenate and ventilate these lungs. And we'll talk about the two classic phenotypes of severe BPD, the athletic, atelectic type, uh, and the cystic type and how the management is different for these two groups of babies. Um, um, this is the from Abman's article in 2017, where it, uh, the mild moderate and mild, non-mild moderate is about the same as we talked about earlier, but in the severe, they have classified them to type one and type two, where the baby may be requiring higher amounts of oxygen, more than 30%, but on CPAP or high, high frequency nasal cannula. And I would also include NIPPV um, um, because it's just non-invasive ventilation. Here, they're talking about mechanical ventilation, but I, uh, I believe they're uh, referring to invasive mechanical ventilation for the type 2 type of the severe BPD. I mentioned to you that uh, the severe BPD tends to have, be present in two different uh, uh, clinical phenotypes. Uh, one is the one where there the cystic lesions, and, and the other one where the athletic variety. Unfortunately, um, it would be nice if the lungs were absolutely homogeneous in one or the other variety, because then you can basically target or personalize the strategy to each of these lungs, but it doesn't happen that in real life. In real life, there are areas of atelectasis and areas of uh, cystic lesion, and you have to try to balance the management approach to these two, um, uh, these two uh, lung uh, phenotypes. So, so one, one, has to be, one has to be a little bit bold, because as neonatologists, we tend not to give higher settings in of the peep or the lung of the, or the tidal volume, but these babies are much older, the lungs are much more stiffer and stronger, so to speak, in the sense that they can handle these higher pressures. But because if you have low tidal volumes and short inspiratory times, you will not be doing a good job with oxygenating and ventilation. However, if you use higher tidal volumes and longer inspiratory times and higher peeps, you will improve the gas distribution, you will have a lower PCO2, lower FiO2, and hopefully less atelectasis. Let me give you some examples as I go along. So with severe BPD, we will use much higher peeps. We will go to six to 12 centimeters of water pressure. Um, I have used up to 14 to 15 in a particular baby if needed. Tidal volumes are now moved from your six to seven to about eight to 12 ml per kilogram uh, tight. And the eye time has been increased to more than 0.55. I rarely go more than 0.6 uh, seconds, um, <clears throat> but we have routinely gone up to 0.45 and 0.5 to manage these babies. And the pressure support ventilation settings are, as, I, as you can see on your screen around six to eight. So this uh, uh, cartoon gives an idea of how we manage these babies. So let's talk about the two uh, phenotypes. So if you have a baby that has most likely atlectic, more, more atlectic variety of severe BPD, uh, clinically you can find that the babies tend to move uh, very quickly as the chest movement and expression is very abrupt or, or smaller frequency. Uh, if you look at the x-ray, tend to be predominantly hazy. And of course, you, uh, their parents look like a wet like this. In these babies, 
most of the time you're dealing with an oxygenation issue. You've got to open up the lungs. You've got to get the oxygen into the alveoli so then it can cross over into the bloodstream. And so we would use higher peeps, six to eight or more than 12, and we will use, the tidal volumes are not required that high, so it can probably be okay around four to seven ml per kilogram. And hopefully you will see some improvement in the chest breathing, uh, chest movement, and you can get some normal blood gases. The ones that babies tend to keep their lungs over expanded and the chest movement in expiration, you can see they tend to stack it up or tend to have tent their airway, <coughs> tend their, um, their chest wall. <coughs> and if you do an x-ray, you will find that they tend to have predominantly cystic lesions with over distended alveoli. And here, the situation is mostly getting rid of the CO2. Uh, and here, what we do is we tend to keep the moderate peep, five to eight, but we increase the tidal volume. So we are trying to get the, um, the lungs to wash out the CO2, and hopefully you will be able to get normal PO2 and normal PCO2 in this, in this format. Uh, let me give you some more examples in, by x-rays and to show you how we have actually done these approaches and we have had good responses. Um, so here we will start with the atlectic variety where we are dealing with a more of atlectasis and we need to open up the lung by using higher peeps. And so in the first x-ray, you can see this baby is an SIMB mode as a PEP of 26 and a PEEP of 11. Um, and the oxygen requirement is about 95% or 0.95 FiO2. What we have done over here, we've just gone up from 11 to 12. And you can see the lung, which is more atlectic, has opened up a little bit nicely over here. And we were able to go down from the FiO2 of 0.95 to 0.87. Like I said, it doesn't seem very dramatic, uh, but it's giving us a directionality of where to move. Um, as I mentioned earlier, anything above 80% pretty much is, as far as the oxygen is concerned, is pretty much going to create the same amount of damage. So this is really not as much as we would like, um, but let's move on and see over here. Here, what we have done is we have a peep of 10 and you can see the atlectasis in this baby and we have used the pressure support of 13 and I time of 0.5 and the oxygen requirement is 0.95. Here, a simple move of the, of the PEP from 10 to 11 has really nicely opened up the lungs over here. You can see this nicely opened up lung. There's still some atlectasis in the right upper zone but we've been able to decrease the FiO2 from 90, 0.95 to 0.78. So making a little bit of more progress. And in this situation, we would probably do some chest PT or try to open up the right upper, upper lobe um, and maybe even go up higher on the peep to see if I, could, if I can get it down to around 60%. So in the diff second variety of phenotype of these babies where we are dealing with uh, the cystic variety, where there's mostly a ventilation issue, and I'll give you some examples of that. And here we're going to manipulate the eye time. You can see this baby has pretty bad lungs, uh, chest tubes on both sides, over expansion. You can see some cystic lesions over here. And you look at the eye time of 0.32. What we have done over here is we have if we decreased the tidal volume a little bit, but pretty much remained the same in most situations. But the main thing of difference over here is we have changed the eye time from 0.32 to 0.28. By decreasing the eye time, what we have done is we have increasing the E time, allowing more time for the baby to wash out the CO2. Um, um, we have kept initially setting the same, except we tried to decrease the PIP from 25 to 22 because we felt the lungs were overexpanded and they're still overexpanded, um, but at least we have been able to get the FiO2 down by uh, ventilating the baby a little bit better. And over time, what we have found is, what we were able to see is we were able to go down, keep going down on the PIP from 20 to 18, and the eye time, we remained the same, um, but nicely, the lungs seem to be healing a little bit, even though the chest tubes are still there, and the FiO2 has dropped down to 0.4 and then down to 0.3. Um, obviously, we would first try to get rid of the chest tube and then potentially try to get rid of the endotracheal tube in this baby. The other thing that we have to deal with babies with uh, moderate severe BPD uh, is BPD spells. And the thing with BPD spells is that it's mostly a bronchospastic response, and especially with these bigger babies who have endotracheal tubes in place, um, they are very they can get very agitated, and with the agitation, they can with the uh, tracheobronchial malaria being also being present, they tend to collapse the airways, and then you're landing up with trying to get the, get them back to you know get the saturations up. The the key to managing these babies is sedation. While of course most people tend to go there and start giving nebulizers, the bronchodilators, and stuff, but the key is sedation. You need to sedate the baby and calm the baby down first, and then you can increase the peep or increase the tidal volume as the case may be. And usually babies do pretty well. So keeping a low level of sedation in these in bigger babies tend to tend to help uh, with tend to help with the BPD spells. Um, so these are uh, the um, NICU management for the tidal volume. The early BPD I told you tidal volume three point five to around five to six, uh, 
was established five to six, but once you reach the severe variety, as, as we talked about earlier, we will go up to eight to 10 to 12 to even up to 14. But in most circumstances, we will use, a, um, uh, use somewhere between eight to 12 uh, ml per kilogram. Again, depending upon which is the athletic variety or the cystic variety and, and seeing the response of the baby to our other management strategies in terms of manipulating the eye time um, or the uh, peak in, in different situations. Now for the oxygen saturation target. So, you know, there was this study, the support study, um, my center at that time was, I was at Yale and we were, I was the PI, a local PI on that. And that, you know, always had this issue about it giving higher S, uh, saturation targets. Uh, you had less mortality, but more BPD and more ROP. So we have always tried to balance it. Uh, initially, when I wrote this chapter, um, we kept our saturation 87 to 93. We have actually published data using these at, um, at our site at Center at Yale, where we found we have been able to decrease BPD as well as ROP, and we did not have an increase in mortality. Nowadays, we tend to use targets of 89 to 94, and our alarm limits are 88 to 95 percent. So most of the time, we are usually sitting on the lower 90 side in an effort to decrease BPD and decrease ROP, and hopefully uh, not make an impact on mortality. And of course, I'm, this institution I'm working on is relatively new to me. I've only been, I've been less than a year, but the previous institutions I've worked in uh, using these targets, we've had, we have been able to decrease BPD and ROP without making an impact on mortality of these smaller babies. So to start summarizing this part of my talk, um, just want to uh, highlight the few facts uh, about how we manage the early phase. As I mentioned earlier, um, a target of 89 to 94 with alarm limits of 88 to 95 percent. The highlight of the ventilatory strategy is avoid intubation. If intubated, give surfactant and do early. By early surfactant, I mean within two hours, if you, and preferably ensure. If you're going to use inspiratory time, shorter inspiratory times, you have to use rapid rates. Use low PEEP and low PEEP, um, four, six, seven. And I know there are uh, a difference of opinion about the use of PEEP. Some folks have used higher PEEP, uh, but I'm just giving you the experience that we've been having in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, over, the, over the years in different institutions that I have have been involved with working in. My effort has always been to try to extubate the babies. So I don't like to keep the babies intubated and I'll try to extubate them as soon as possible. And the maximum effort is to try to extubate them within the first 72 hours of life and keep them extubated at least for a few days. Uh, and, uh, and we are blood gas targets I've mentioned over here. We only use high frequency oscillation uh, ventilation for rescue uh, if conventional ventilation fails. Uh, we are we're very fond of caffeine. We actually start caffeine right from birth. So, you know, ampicillin gentamicin, the third drug the baby gets is caffeine. And I will use caffeine till the baby is actually off respiratory support, even if the baby is beyond 36, 37 weeks of gestation. Um, the importance of caffeine is because not only it obviously has a stimulatory effect on the brain, which obviously should be mature by 36 weeks, uh, hopefully in most babies, but it also has this action on the diaphragm and it actually decreases the, de uh, decreases the fatigability of the diaphragm it is also a weak bronchodilator, and it is also a weak uh, um, diuretic. And so these, the action of the diaphragm is very important because for the baby, the diaphragm is the most important respiratory muscle. For us, it is the intercostals and subcostals, but for the baby, it is the, it is the diaphragm. And that is why we, we when adults, we breathe, uh, we breathe uh, thoraco-abdominal, while in babies, it is abdominal-thoracic. So anything I can do to get the diaphragm working well and uh, you know, basically tone it up like it's running a marathon, uh, it does help. And caffeine is very safe, and we've not really had any problems with side effects. Vitamin A, um, you can use, um, as recommended is 5,000 international units IM. All other modes of uh, giving this drug doesn't seem to really work, uh, but just keep in mind that the cost-benefit ratio, use-benefit ratio is that for every additional infant survived without BPD, you have 14 to 15 infants. Uh, somewhat controversial because I think it depends upon the level of vitamin A the baby have. If the mom is vitamin A sufficient, it is likely the baby will be vitamin A sufficient, but definitely it is one of the supportive treatments or one of the suggested treatments if you really have a high incidence of BPD. We don't routinely use vitamin A in our center. Uh, keeping the baby dry always helps, um, and there is enough data to support that. So the maximum fluid we try to reach is 140 uh, and to get the calories because Nothing like food to get the babies to make new lungs. For the evolving phase, uh, oxygen supplementation uh, target ranges are the same. And once again, the effort is to try to get the baby to nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation. Like I said, we don't routinely extubate to CPAP. We do NIPTV, then we move to CPAP and then cannula. Um, 
the NIPPB talk is a separate lecture by itself. Um, so I, I will go, I will only highlight a few things in a couple of slides from now. Um, same for methylxanthine, vitamin A, steroids. So I don't tend to use steroids to extubate the baby till the baby is at least three to four weeks of age because of the concern for neurodevelop adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes. And when we do use steroids, we use the short course, the dark course, and the effort is that within 48 hours of giving it, let's try and extubate the baby to NIPPV and let's try to keep the baby extubated. Before the, before the first three, four weeks of life, we will use um, diuretics uh, to try to see if we can decrease the FiO2 requirements. And of course, we will try to minimize uh, the fluid intake uh, and, and at the same time not to compromise too much with the calories. Among the diuretics, um, frusamide is usually what we start off with, but I don't like to use it chronically because it's also calciuric. So then you're lining up with the problems of uh, high, you know, the nephrocalcinosis is there. And of course, um, you can um, make osteopenia prematurity worse because frusamide is calciuric and you lose a lot of calcium from the bones into the urine if you use it for long term. I prefer to use uh, thiazides, and we tend to use one usually chlorothiazide uh, every day. A uh, maximum dose of that is around 40 milligram per kilogram per day. Um, we add spironolactone if we need to, and we would use four milligram per kilogram, kilogram per day maximum dose. And we usually do it in divided Q12 doses, uh, and we use it chronically, and we would send a baby home on these drugs if we can get the baby off oxygen. In the established phase, uh, it is important to um, do the screening for pulmonary hypertension. And if you are worried about it or if you see it, then we tend to keep our oxygen targets a little bit higher, somewhere in the 92 to 95 percent. So 92 to 98, and trying to stay around 94 to 95 percent as long as the eyes are okay. The blood gas targets I've already mentioned. Uh, if you are on nasal cannula oxygen or CPAP and oxygen, um, oral prednisolone therapy might be helpful. It is a one week course, and we might be able to get the baby off oxygen. Uh, again, the effort is to see, again, because our population is such that I don't usually like to send a baby home, home on oxygen. So we try our best to get the baby off the cannula, off the oxygen uh, before going home. And it's okay to use uh, the diuretics, the chronic diuretics, because that can be weaned off on follow-up. The beta agonists and anticholinergics are used intermittently, uh, especially if you find the baby has a bronchospasm. Um, it probably gives transient relief, doesn't seem to harm, uh, but we would use it if, if needed. Uh, we focus a lot on nutrition because nutrition, food, food, food. Giving calories of at least 110 to 120 kilocalories per kilo per day is really, really critical. Um, making sure you have the appropriate nitrogen balance. Um, you know, don't give too much fat because we don't want the baby to go horizontally. We want the baby to go vertically. The length of the baby correlates very well with lung growth. And so it is important to not make the baby fat in sense, but the maybe make the baby tall, so to speak. Uh, of course, if you're planning to send the baby home, we would do the uh, prophylaxis against RSV and influenza to decrease the secondary infections that can happen, which can obviously add on to the morbidity of these babies on follow-up because they already have a compromised lung to start off with. Uh, as you are aware, it's good. You know, the lungs grow very well for the first few years of life, at least eight, maybe till seven, eight years. Some people have said even till 10 to 12 years, you're making some alveoli. So if you can avoid more injury and provide good nutrition uh, and hopefully avoid things like smoking and environmental pollutants, Hopefully, we will have a lung that is reasonable and these babies will do okay in the future. Uh, this is um, for the severe BPD. So the early part, we have already gone and talked about it, but for the established BPD, what I want to highlight, uh, the severe variety is that you will use larger tidal volumes, longer eye times. I, like I said, I don't usually go beyond 0.6. Um, I just don't have that, that much of experience, but there may be other folks who have more experience with using higher eye times. I focus a lot on the tidal volumes and increasing the peak. Uh, again, trying to balance it out. Sometimes I need to get a um, bronchoscopy done to see the tracheo, um, how much malaysia is there. And during bronchoscopy, you can crank up the ventilator setting to see how much you can open up the airway. And once you reach the, max, you know, the magical number, you know that that's the minimum uh, uh, peep you require to open up the airway. And we usually go a little bit beyond that to make sure uh, if you have good blood gases, the blood gas exchange is happening well. Keep in mind that keeping higher oxygen saturation is actually helpful at this stage, especially if you're worried about pulmonary hypertension or you have pulmonary hypertension. Uh, that's, of course, a separate lecture of BPD-associated pulmonary hypertension, which uh, I believe Ambal will be, given, um, will be giving after this talk. If we do have specific criteria for discharge on oxygen, so we usually will not send the babies home unless they're at least 36 weeks PMA. They don't have apnea or acute medical problems. They hopefully are immunized appropriately based on their chronologic age. They have optimum weight gain. And once again, we do try to get them off, but we usually will send them home on 0.5 liters per minute or less. Uh, and 100% and then try to wean off the flow and hopefully get the baby off 
most of the time these babies are on chronic diuretic and we also send them home on a monitor where we have SPO2 checks done and, the, and that will be also be followed up um, by the PD pulmonologist and our developmental follow-up clinic. The main thing, and I've highlighted this multiple times, but I just want to briefly go over some of the issues about how we get rid of the tube and how we do that. Uh, NIPTV is essentially uh, giving IMV in a CPAP mode. I know some earlier studies have shown it well helpful for um, um, decreasing apnea, but Garland's paper in 1985 brought up this concern of GI perforations. And then after that, nobody actually touched this technique. Uh, and so we have <coughs> um, Neil Finer from San Diego and, and us um, from, I was in um, Philadelphia at that time. We independently published our papers in pediatric about a month apart using synchronized NIPPV and we're using the Grace capsule. And I'll show you a photo of that in a minute. So how does NIPPV work? There is the washout of uh, nasal frame to space, reduced inspiratory resistance, stability of chest wall, reduced work of breathing. This is all with S when it's synchronized. And uh, this becomes even more better when you're synchronized. Um, and I will show you that in the next slide here. So here you can see uh, how we synchronize. So the one that I was used to using is called the infant star. And we use the grace peak capsule, which is a basically a pressure sensor. And it detects the movement of the abdomen because the diaphragm moves and the abdomen moves. And it would pick up the signal, send it to the ventilator, and the ventilator would give the breath. Unfortunately, we do not have the ventilator in the USA anymore. And so we only do NIPTV. There is a nasal flow sensor which synchronizes the non-invasive ventilation called, um, called the Julia ventilator, G-I-U-L-I-A. I don't have access to it. I have seen it functioning in, in Italian and ICUs, um, but I do not really have any experience with it. Um, there, of course, is NAVA. And uh, that is basically detected, the signal from the diaphragm from the phrenic nerve is detected by uh, the esophageal probe. Uh, and that is also synchronizes. Um, I tried, I have not been able to mimic the um, non-invasive NAVA, the non-invasive NAVA has not been able to mimic the effect, uh, the synchronized NIPPV settings and outcomes that I have done in my hands. Uh, I, I think more work needs to get done. And I'm also working on trying to um, develop a newer method of doing synchronization using um, a, a belly band, which detects these abdominal excursions. Uh, we'll see if that works out. What I want to highlight is that NIPPV is not just a question of just giving CPAP. There is a rate uh, and the intermittent nature of it um, makes it an important parameter of how it works. And I will show, it, show the proof of that in an X-ray in a few minutes. I tend to use the nomenclature of primary mode of nasal ventilation and secondary mode, essentially because I want to again highlight the fact that we want to use the cutoff value of two hours to give surfactant. If you need to give surfactant, don't keep the baby long on CPAP because the longer you delay surfactant, the more likely you're going to have difficulty in the baby um, uh, baby getting better. Um, so give surfactant and get the tube out as soon as possible. Uh, these are the settings that I tend to use. So I will start with about, so if I'm doing it right from the beginning, like uh, uh, right like from the birth, if I use the primary mode of within two hours, uh, even if the baby has got some surfactant, I will use a four centimeter higher than what the baby was receiving while it was invasively ventilated. And when I watch for the excursion of the baby, watch for the chest rise, listen to the baby, look at the saturation, and then um, I will get a gas in about an hour to see where we are, and I will manipulate the setting just like you would do if you had an endotracheal tube ventilated baby. I don't try to use very high peeps um, because I'm depending on the PIP to give the higher pressure. Uh, and the main reason is that I'm concerned that if I use higher peeps, I'm worried about air leaks in this early stage. And by giving intermittent uh, pressure, I'm trying to avoid that risk. I also always put in a decompression tube, OG tube of size eight French um, or more, um, six to eight, eight to eight to nine French, uh, depending on the size of the baby, which is connected to a syringe, 10 cc syringe with the plunger out. And that is kept above the baby to get rid of the air or gas in the stomach. Because, you know, as we talked about earlier, this worry about GI perforation is there. And so far, the data on that is that has been very, very safe. and as long as you do these precautions, it is unlikely you will get GI perforation in these babies. Um, I, I obviously use these rates and I times like you see over here. Importantly is that I do have maximum limits of using uh, when, when I would consider intubating the baby. Plus I have some other parameters that we use to what we consider NIP failure. And uh, the parameters here for the map would be less, uh, we want to keep maximum for 14 or 16, depending upon the size of the baby. And if you need higher pressures, usually the babies will be on much higher oxygen, like 60 or 80%, and that itself will make us intubate the baby. 
uh, these, if you're in the secondary mode, you've kept the tube in for two, more than two hours, maybe days to weeks. We reach the setting that I mentioned earlier. And here, the lungs are a little better shaped. I usually start with a lower, of only two centimeters higher than what the intubated PIP is. But I will go up higher depending upon the movement of the chest wall and the air entry. And I use the same parameters in terms of the maximal support. This is, I wanted to show you an evidence of what happens when I put a baby on an, an IPPV. Here, the first X-ray, you can see the haziness. Um, uh, and once I put the baby in an IPPV, I'm able to get a much better, a better air entry. Saturations go up. It is important to understand that it's not just giving a CPAP. You know, the question is, can you just give CPAPs of 8 or 10 or 12 and not give an IPPV? Uh, I suppose you could do that. If you use higher CPAP, you can get away with better oxygenation and ventilation versus lower CPAP. And that has been shown by a paper published by Bankalari's group. But what is the upper limit? And, and where, are, where, is the li where is the level that you would be concerned with? Uh, I worry about it because I'm using prongs, the nasal CPAP prongs that are snug, and I'm closing them out, that the pressure is continuously being given to the lung. Uh, if I use only higher CPAP, I'm worried about air leaks. So I prefer to use the NIPPV approach where I'm giving intermittently higher pressures, and they're higher than your basal level of PEEP, obviously, uh, but it seems to work very well in terms of keeping the lung expanded uh, and preventing atelectasis. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, allowing oxygenation and ventilation to happen. Uh, these are the changes that we make uh, depending upon what we are picking up on the blood gas, hypoxemia, hypercarbia, or both. Uh, we tend to increase the eye times, um, gone up to 0.55, even up to 0.6. Um, I will increase the rate 40, I've gone up to 45. Uh, and peeps, I've told you the reason why I tend to limit to eight. Um, if a baby is put on NIPPV, so baby don't see if having apnea and you want to intubate, I would suggest try NIPPV. Because, and uh, usually these lungs are in much better shape, so usually you do not need higher pressures, peep or peep, and we tend to use higher rates to try and overcome uh, this apneic episodes. Uh, obviously, if the baby will be on caffeine as, uh, if in this uh, circumstance. Dr. Bandari, so, five minutes. Yeah, so the conceptual model to reduce BPD initially is uh, try to get the baby onto nasal ventilation, and, and if you have to do invasive ventilation, focus on volume guarantee or SIMV, and then try to be again excessive, uh, aggressively weaning to decrease the FiO2 and uh, once you reach a certain FiO2 and mean ever pressure. Um, so a combination of factors, so early extubation, parental nutrition, vitamin A, minimize hyperoxia, reduce valor trauma and prevent infection will probably get you to prevent BPD. And with that, I'm going to stop. That's all I have for now. Uh, happy to take any questions. Um, if I cannot answer, I would highly recommend you check out these publications. Uh, most of the talk here, slides, uh, are from this textbook. Uh, this has a lot of interesting information about the different aspects of BPD, pathogenesis, as well as treatment. Uh, the, my latest, the third book that I published recently this year is on uh, tantalizing therapeutics. This has a very nice chapter by Martin Kessler and Ashish Gupta, uh, where they've talked about different forms of ventilation and a, a very nice description about volume-targeted ventilation that you might be interested in. Uh, with that, um, I will stop. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Bandari, for this uh, comprehensive review about uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And we have uh, some questions here. I'll start with the easy questions that you probably uh, mentioned some of them during your talk. We have a question here asking about what's the difference between the new and the old bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Yeah. So as I showed in one of the previous slides, uh, the old bronchopulmonary dysplasia used to happen when we would keep these babies ventilated at much higher pressures and much higher oxygen concentrations. And of course, these babies are older. So you are talking of babies who were more than 28 weeks of gestation and they were on you know, 50, 60, 80 percent oxygen and intubated and kept intubated for weeks on end. Uh, and pathologically, the main thing you would see in these babies, the inflammation would be there, but fibrosis was a very important pathologic hallmark in these babies. The new BPD that we see is essentially for babies less than 28 weeks of gestation. They are mostly in the late canalicular stage of, of their lung development. We are, we are more cognizant of the fact that we don't want to use higher pressure and higher oxygen exposures. So we tend to get rid of the tube and, get, and try to stay on the lower end of the oxygen. We are aggressive with giving surfactant in these babies early on. And these babies tend to have mostly simplified alveoli and dysregulated vascular development, but very minimal, if any, fibrosis. So, like, let's say that the new bronchopulmonary dysplasia has less fibrosis, but have like maybe more uh, alveolar and uh, blood supply distortion, something like that. That's can yes, be a yeah. So fibrosis is very minimal, or hardly any fibrosis in new BPD. Yes.
We have another question that also probably also you tackle it in your talk. Uh, what is the evidence behind that NIPPV is superior than CPAP? And the, of course, uh, there is a lot of evidence. Um, there are Cochrane reviews for that. I have been involved in at least five uh, randomized trials um, pub, uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, and other folks have also published data on it. Uh, Ramanathan's papers are there. So I think just look at the Cochrane review and, I'll, and uh, by Brigitte Lemaire and it'll show you there is more than enough data around the world that NIPPV has a superior efficacy in keeping the baby extubated. Now, the issue about decreasing BPD has not been consistent, but I think part of the reason is how people use NIPPV. If you do not, if you're not aggressive with the settings of NIPPV, and I would like to use the word, if you use very low settings, you know, like low PIPs or low, and you limit yourself to that, and don't make an effort to keep the tube out, then of course it will not make a difference in NIPPV. And that is one of the concerns of the, of the biggest study done on nasal ventilation, which of course was a pragmatic trial, uh, but the settings they use were much, much lower than what, for example, I have advocated and what uh, Ram, uh, Ram, Ramanathan, Dr. Ramanathan from UCLA has advocated. You tend to be, you need to be more aggressive in your PIP and PEEP and rate and mean error pressure. And if you do that, at least in our hands, we have, we have published work that in our hands, using that as well as FIO2 management, uh, saturation targeting and all that, we've managed to decrease PPD rates um, in our units. So Dr. Bhandari, I mean, uh, Dr. Meet, uh, do you are you like when you're taking uh, babies from the delivery room, so uh, if you're not, uh, they don't need a, like you are giving uh, insure. So are you putting on NIPPV or you're putting on CPAP? Yeah, so what happens is if they don't require, we will put them on, um, on CPAP uh, and then we'll see what they do. However, suppose we are, giving them, you know, we have the TPs, resuscitator or the Neopuff, and if you are doing that at the time of resuscitation and taking the baby like that, then we will put them on the NIPPV. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the protocol that we use nowadays. Okay. You mentioned that you don't have a lot of experience with the synchronized NIPPV, but is there any evidence that the synchronized NIPPV can reduce bronchopulmonary dyspareunia? Is it superior than the and yes. IPPV alone. Yeah. Yeah. So most of most of our earlier work was done on synchronized, and even Neil Finer's work, and uh, um, they also used the same Grespi capsule, and so did the UCLA. Uh, there is enough evidence that, in terms of the physiologic evidence, in terms of decreased breathing effort and increase uh, uh, increase um, um, uh, less less um, um, less uh, um, <clears throat> damage potentially less damage to the baby's lungs and stuff like that on physiological measurements. We have published a, a, a paper where we have looked at NIPPV outcomes versus SS synchronized NIPPV outcomes, and we actually did not find a difference in the BPD outcome. We had the similar results. But I think it is a combination of the fact that we, we make a lot of effort to keep the tube, uh, the, tube, the tube out of the baby, and also we do other stuff, like I mentioned, the other supportive management in terms of oxygen targeting and stuff like that. Um, but what, what was your way of synchronization? Do you use the flow synchronization like the Italian... Uh, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't have any experience with it, uh, and I've not seen a randomized clinical trial, you know, to the best of my knowledge, uh, but I do know that it's used in Europe, um, and uh, they seem to have good outcomes, um, but I'm not sure that I can say for sure that it's shown to be definitely decreased BPD compared to, you know, Which way is synchronized? What did you use to synchronize the NIPP in your what? I'm sorry, can you ask the question again? What, what did you use to synchronize the NIPPV in your unit? Capsule, yeah. you said? I use, yeah, so I use the infant star ventilator with the star sink, which is essentially the Grace B capsule. It's a, it's a pressure transducer, the one, the picture I showed you of a capsule and with a band around the baby's belly, and that would detect the movement, and that is what I had used. Yes. So, Dr. Okay. Okay. I have one question. Can I have okay. one question? Okay. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, th uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Mandari. I, I want uh, to ask you that uh, the failure rate on, on a very small baby, less than 27 weeks, is a very high here uh, in UAE. Uh, so do you recommend that to give the surfactant uh, in those babies? Uh, we are using both Insure and the LISA technique. What is your experience? As you said in your lecture also that you have a very low threshold to give the surfactant as early as possible. Can you, can you comment and emphasize on that a little bit? Because so, the failure uh, rate on the CPAP here is very, very high. Okay. 
So I think baby, about, they're small babies. Yeah. So I think if I understand your question, you're asking about the lease or, or in less invasive mode of uh, giving surfactant versus ensure what is happening in terms of decreasing BPD. Um, am I correct? That's the question you're asking? No, uh, I, I am asking that if we, uh, give, uh, if we ha give the surfactant as early as possible or uh, just to give the surfactant not to wait when the CPAP fail, then to give the surfactant in a baby's less than 26 weeks. Okay. So, because the higher rate here is very high rate of CPAP failure in those babies, yeah. 27 okay. below and 26 below, they are very. Okay. So, uh, wh whatever the technique you use, okay. we are using Lisa and Ensure both. Okay. So, I think you're talking about prophylactic surfactant that you want to give, if you want to give surfactant or, uh, soon as the baby is born in all babies. And I would recommend. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I would recommend the answer to that is no, because there are studies that have very nicely shown, and for babies less than 28 weeks, including babies less than 28 weeks, that you would be over treating at least 30 to 50 percent of these babies. You're giving a treatment that the babies actually do not need. Um, so I would recommend yeah. you do not use prophylactic surfactant. I would also recommend you use CPAP early, um, you know, and or NIPPV early, but. The trick here is that don't keep the baby on CPAP for a long period of time. I'm saying that if the baby is on 25% oxygen and you're going up to 30% oxygen, that is enough of an indication for me to give surfactant. So keep yeah, a low that, threshold. That's I want to. Within the first two hours, keep a low threshold. Any movement of the oxygen going up, or if you need to go up from the CPAP of six to seven, that is enough for me exactly. to intubate, or if you want to use Lisa or Lisa, exactly. do that and give surfactant. Yeah, actually, this is my question that we as try to do it as soon as possible, put the baby on CPAP and as soon as we know that the oxygen requirement is going up in those small babies, give the surfactant and then see the baby. Uh, yeah, yeah, but when that's you my question. Given Thanks. surfactant, after you have given surfactant, then you need to extubate to NIPTV. That is very important. Yeah. Because the success we are doing this. is yeah. like 94% versus... Dantari, you have uh, two questions about your ventilator strategies. Uh, the first question about using low tidal volume. You said you use three to six, and uh, is it really physiologic to use the tidal volume less than four? Yeah. So again, it depends on the the size of the baby. Uh, most of the time, we are actually I put in three to six because I just wanted to give a range. In most situations, actually, I start around four, uh, and then I go up to five. And most of the time, we are sitting around five, five point five ml per kilogram okay. in most of our babies. And the other question about using the eye time, you mentioned that uh, using uh, not more than 0.6, but in some unit guided by the ventilator graphics, actually sometimes you go to 0.8 and even sometimes higher, yeah. depend on. Yeah. Uh, I think there are units, at least in the US, and there may be units other parts of the world that, you know, that have dealing with very severe BPD um, uh, and much bigger babies, and they have much larger numbers of severe BPD babies than I have had the exposure to. Uh, and in those situations, they may go up to that high time. I just don't have the, I don't usually see that much of severe BPD because like I mentioned to you, I am very aggressive in my group. I, I take the tube out. So I try not to get into that severe BPD stage, uh, but they are of course, you know, bigger tertiary level units uh, that, uh, that, have, that have that those kind of babies and they may be using those high high times. Okay. Uh, then um, then to back to you. Of, uh, extubating, like if you're extubating the baby and you're putting on NIPPV, but you are requiring a very high setting on NIPPV. So would it be better to, you know, intubate and then go on a lower setting? And uh, I mean, what would be the... Yeah. So there are certain specific failure criteria that I use. So the one I've already told you about the maximum settings I would use. So if you're on higher settings and you've reached the mean airway pressure more than 14 or 16, depending upon the baby, I would intubate. If the baby has a pH of less than 7.2 and a PaCO2 of more than 65, arterial CO2 of more than 65, I would intubate. If the baby has a single episode of apnea requiring um, uh, significant resuscitation, which means requiring uh, bag and mask ventilation, then I would intubate. If the baby has frequent apneic episodes, despite increasing the you know, settings uh, more than two to three per hour, then I would intubate. Again, remember these babies already are on caffeine. I tend to, what I can tell you that uh, if you are touching 60% or more on on the uh, NIPPV setting, you need to move your mean airway pressure and your eye time and stuff like that to get the setting done and try to keep the FiO2 uh, le less than 40% as much as possible. Going beyond 60 to 70% despite higher setting, is you are more likely to get intubated. If I have one more minute, let me just also tell you the three types of babies who fail NIPPV. The first type of babies usually fail in the first six hours of life after we extubated them. 
uh, six hours of after excavation. Those babies really are very weak and, uh, and uh, we can't really predict which ones are going to fail. I can tell you, if you're a female and you have a bigger weight compared to males, you tend to be successful. That's all I can say right now. If you have, but the second category of babies who slowly start requiring more oxygen, 0 0.35, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, those babies you got to keep watch on because that happens in the next few days. And what you need to see, when you see that effort to climbing up, uh, you, what you need to, you need to crank up your mean airway pressure. You can do that by increasing your PIP or eye time as the case may be. And those are the ones I try to my best to try and avoid, you know, getting the tube back in and try to keep the, CO, uh, the FiO2 less than 60% as much as possible by increasing the settings till you reach your maximum setting. The third category of babies who fail NIPTV are the ones who get infected or NEC or something like that. And those babies, I just reintubate. I don't try to do anything. The infection that there's a cardiovascular collapse and I can't really do anything about the blood pressure and all that. So I really intubate. I treat them for at least a week of life. It took for one week antibiotics, whatever else I need to do. And then hopefully I try to extubate them again. So someone was asking, what are your like failure rates in your unit when you are dealing with extremely preterm babies? Yeah. And, so, uh, uh, again, if you look at, if, if I'm dealing with only babies, say less than 750 grams or less than 1000 grams, if I look at overall, my failure rate all extra, all extra, all have extubated the baby to an IPTV, it can be as high as 70 to 80 percent. It's high if I just look at any extubation rate. However, like I just mentioned to you, the fail, the, the worry that you're going to re, uh, ex, fail extubation should not stop you from extubation. Because if you ask me what is my success rate in keeping the baby extubated in the first few days of life, that is much higher. You see? So, so even if they get reintubated, I don't worry too much about it. Because I have, uh, reintubation does not seem to increase the risk of BPD, and we have published this. And again, like I said, if you look at look at you know put my put look on PubMed and Leif Nellin, N E L I N has published this from Nationwide, and Triplani has also published this, and they use the same terminology. Like I said, the the worry that you may have to reintubate the baby two days later, or five days later, or two weeks later, should not stop you from extubating the baby. And please focus on the 24 to 72 hour time point. At first 72 hours, especially between 24 and 72 hours, if you can extubate the baby and keep the baby extubated, the hope is that you are interfering or, um, or um, managing or decreasing or, or changing the immune response that the baby can then hopefully try to resolve the lung injury in a better way and avoid getting, if not avoid BPD altogether, at least try to decrease the severity of the BPD that the baby might get. How about the, the extremely tiny babies, you know, the 24, 25 weeks? If the are baby allows me to extubate, I will extubate. I, if you want, you know, again, there are exceptions to the rule. Um, if you want to know, my smallest baby that I have extubated and uh, kept extubated is 490 grams, uh, mm -hmm. at least for a week. <laughs> That's the baby got reintubated. Um, Out of so, what's the uh, interest, which interface you use for them for CPAP? Because sometimes we have our time to find the uh, appropriate size for those babies, especially yeah. those 500. So, um, I like to, when I'm doing uh, an IPPV, I like to use the CPAP prongs, the ones that fit in well. So either it's Inca, Argyle, um, uh, Freca, uh, Fisher Packel, the ones that fit in well. I also make very yeah. low short by nasal prongs. Short by yeah, nasal, prong. nasal prongs. Nasal prongs. So those companies I mentioned, I don't have a particular choice. They need to be short and they need to fit in snug. Uh, and I always try to close the mouth by a pacifier or something I can use to close the mouth. But I also have the OG tube in there to decompress the stomach. So there is always going to be some degree of leak, but at least I try to keep. And we also have used nasal mask to do it if I'm worried about the nose. Uh, I yeah. don't use routinely the RAM cannula for routine NIPPV. Uh, only when they have you know, stabilized a little bit and I'm on lower settings will I use the RAM cannula to do that. Okay. Yeah. Um. There are many questions actually. They are telling, do you, uh, do you uh, as the time passes, are you looking into uh, when you're giving caffeine? Are you looking into like what levels of caffeine are? Like if uh, you need to go higher on the caffeine? Uh, uh, so yeah. so, so you routinely know? we do not measure caffeine levels. So caffeine levels. So we do not routinely measure that. We will give our loading dose and we will give the maintenance dose. If I do find that the babies are in a, in a situation, uh, then I will check. And I usually, if I check and if I, I try to reach the level of 25, 25 units, um, and by, by doing that is that for every increase, so one milligram per kilogram bolus will increase the caffeine level by two units. So I try to reach the 25 level. In some situations like here, if I need to send a caffeine level in my present institution, I need two cc's of blood and I will get the results in like four days. So then I will just arbitrarily increase the dose by 10 to 20% and see what happens. 
it's a very safe drug. The therapeutic to toxic ratio is, you know, uh, the range is very high. You don't usually get into the problem. So if the baby is not having any feeding issues or tachycardia, I feel comfortable in increasing it. But ideally, you, if you are having apneic episodes and you think it's because of low caffeine levels, and keep in mind, every baby is different. You have what, you know, depending on how they, they get rid of uh, caffeine. Um, I will also mention, <laughs> I have to mention this. So in my last book, there is a very nice chapter of caffeine written by Abe Loda, myself and Stefani. Uh, we talked about all of these practical parts, how to measure, how to do it, when to use it, when to stop it. All of those questions are answered. Um, and it'll take me more time to explain it, but hopefully you got the, uh, some answer to the question you asked. Uh, another question is when are you, when do you really uh, uh, give steroids and uh, what yeah. kind of uh, dart you are using or you are giving hydrocortisone, so that's yeah. one yeah. So I use steroids only after three or four weeks of life. Um, I don't use before that. If I have a situation where I'm needing higher oxygen or ventilation, I do try to decrease it by using, um, uh, you know, uh, the diuretics to some extent. And uh, once I've reached more than three, four weeks of life and the baby is still on high setting and not being able to extubate, I will use DART. I own uh, dexamethasone, you know, the five-day course. And I try to time my extubation at 48-hour time point of giving it. As, or, or earlier if, if I'm able to go down to the setting that I just mentioned. Yeah, I do not routinely use hydrocortisone or longer courses of um, steroids to extubate the baby. So uh, there's one calculator which is risk calculator and then they said, okay, you, uh, do you recommend that calculator yeah. when you, you, uh, yeah. you can? Yeah, you can use the calculator if it gives you an idea of when to extubate the baby uh, and the risk of BPD versus neurodevelopmental outcome. Um, I tend to focus mostly on the fact that the baby is three weeks old or four weeks old and the tube is not out. You know, for me, the tube is not out is the main reason. Um, you know, uh, if the baby is on 40-50% oxygen, obviously anything above 40% I'm concerned about it. But if the tube is not out, I will be inclined to use that. So I don't tend to use the calculator. For me, is, is the baby intubated or not intubated? Uh, what about inhaled uh, steroids? Um, so routinely inhaled steroids are not very useful and there are enough studies, you know, Oliver Board study recently also looked at that. Um, I will use inhaled steroids uh, when the baby has established BPD, but keep in mind when you're using inhaled steroids at that point, like you manage a baby with BPD, start air, you know, airway disease, like the pulmonologists do, it takes few weeks for it to uh, act. And I would use it pretty much if I'm using, say, for example, I use one week course of prednisolone to get the tube out or get the oxygen low and I still have a baby that's requiring oxygen, I would have probably started inhaled steroids in that baby. But I don't uh, routinely use it before 36 weeks post-mental leave. Okay, last question. Uh, actually, about uh, asked by two here. Why you use Ensure, not Lisa, which is proven to be superior? Yeah, um, we were, the reason we didn't, so we were actually participating in the uh, Peter Dargaville's trial. Um, the, and we just finished recruiting, uh, the, the study has just finished. And so we are waiting for the results of that and chances are hopefully next year, if depending upon what the results show, we will start using it. Uh, we, you know, it's just a question of, we didn't want to, uh, we wanted to have equipoise, we didn't want to mess up uh, what we routinely do because we had a study, ongoing study going on. There are many more questions, but I think the time constraint is there. We might uh, um, Yeah, you, you can tell, tell them to email me. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, it's Bhandari Vineet at uh, Bhandari hyphen Vineet at cooperhealth.edu. You can find me on the internet uh, and just email me and I'll try to answer as many as can I can. Can you repeat the email again, please? So it's my last name, Bhandari hyphen Vineet, V-I-N-E-E-T at cooperhealth, C-O-O-P-E-R-H-E-A-L-T-H dot E-D-U. You, you can just uh, yeah, Google me. You'll, you'll find it. It's not a problem. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhandari. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hisham, for uh, being Thank with you. us. Thank you very much. I think uh, the, we'll go for the next session. So, Sridhar, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Thank you. I mean, uh, Dr. Vineet and Dr. Martin Pluko. I mean, uh, it has been an excellent evening so far, and we have a very interesting topic coming up as well. Uh, uh, by uh, Professor uh, Namusiva Mbalavanan. So, uh, as I said, he has trained in my two institutes where I have trained from before, both from uh, Jipmar Pondicherry and PGI Merchandigar. Uh, before that, I would like to welcome and uh, invite Dr. Anwar Khan, my uh, very good friend and colleague here. Uh, he is the head of uh, neonatology at Dubai Hospital, which is one of the 
deputy tertiary centers owned by the uh, dubai health authority uh, based in dubai he is also associate professor at the dubai medical college for pediatrics and neonatology so uh, dr anwar uh, kindly uh, take over uh, and share the session and you can please introduce uh, professor ambalamana hello thank you dr sridhar is it okay my voice is clear yes it's fine okay thank you dr sridhar for this uh, introduction and uh, i'm really thankful that uh, the organizers especially you and dr uh, monica for inviting me to moderate this beautiful excellent scientific session and uh, uh, it is my really great pleasure and honor to introduce professor nama sivam ambalavanam who is not only having a very glorious sanskrit name but also a bright star in the in the neonatal sky and i think the and he possesses a to his credit one of the longest cv i have ever seen with 71 pages out of which i have just dared to highlight few points i don't know if he should be forgiving me if i have missed anything on that as i as you already said that he he has his post graduates from the from uh, the most prestigious institute of india the pgi and uh, and he also got the neonatal fellowship and uh, american board from university of alabama and i must uh, mention here that uh, from the beginning his medical studies has been brilliant because he has scored the highest mark in all the entrance examinations including from his undergraduate to his post graduate and the arab in and the american board of pediatrics it's really great uh, great honor i must say that currently he is working as a professor of neonatology and a director of uh, neonatal research in the university of alabama birmingham in usa uh, his love and dedication for research has rewarded him to the dean's award for excellence in research in the university of alabama very currently in may 2020 and uh, he, we must know that his major research interests fields are neonatal lung injury lung development and he did extensive work on neonatal pulmonary hypertension and molecular and omics in neonatal lung disease his remarkable research in bpd and biomarkers especially tg web tg beta neonatal nutrition and probiotics he is a very active um, uh, member in the in the multiple research project in the nicsd as well numerous publications i cannot just uh, mention it here and he are, he is author for many neonatal books and i believe the uh, we should we highly commended dr monica to for having chosen none other than professor valan to speak on the topic of bronchopulmonary dysplasia and pulmonary hypertension a field in which he has almost dedicated his career in doing extensive research i am certain that will be it will be very interesting and will be very scientific and everybody will put will like it and enjoy So, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Professor Valan and Dr. Uh, Professor Ambala Valan. The stage is yours. Please start. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anwar, and uh, thank you, uh, Sridhar and Monica and all the other organizers and to Yasser for uh, putting all these audiovisual things together. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, so the topic for today is BPD associated pulmonary hypertension and uh, like beneath in the previous talk if you need to contact me for some questions later you have my email at the bottom of the screen it's very simple it's just ambal@uab.edu so feel free to email me anytime so let me go to the next slide hmm looks like my slides are not advancing let's see okay yeah. uh nothing to disclose okay overview so this is what we are uh, going to discuss this uh, morning for me and evening for you all so the overview of pulmonary hypertension in preterm infants the epidemiology of pulmonary hypertension in bpd the pathogenesis and cardiovascular anomalies that can contribute to pulmonary hypertension Uh, the diagnosis and biomarkers, the therapy, uh, the potential approach to pulmonary hypertension and BPD, uh, the long-term effects of BPD and pulmonary hypertension, and finally some concluding uh, remarks. So this is not anything that's new. So you all know that back in 
um, 53 years ago. Uh, BPD was described uh, for the first time by Northway, Rosen, and Porter in 1967 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And a few years after that, in 1976, uh, his colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Bonikos, described uh, pulmonary uh, fibrosis, necrotizing uh, bronchiolitis, and corpulmonary. So they looked at the histology of 21 infants who died of BPD, and they found that six of those 21 had signs of cardiac stress, including corporal manner. So on the right, you can uh, see what looks like a circular structure with a lot of uh, thick wall, and that's actually a pulmonary artery with a lot of vascular remodeling. So this is not anything new. This is something that's been known for a long time, uh, but it's not something that people think about. We just think of lung fibrosis or inhibition of lung development. We don't really think too much about vasculature. So when do preterm infants have pulmonary hypertension? If you are to measure the pulmonary pressures in any preterm infant with significant lung pathology, for example, a baby with uh, severe respiratory distress syndrome and hypoxic respiratory failure, that's HRF, you will find that they have elevated pulmonary arterial pressures. Uh, you don't call it PPHN because generally PPHN is a term applied to term babies, but any infant with significant lung pathology would have an elevation of pulmonary arterial pressure. You can also have an increase in pulmonary arterial pressure in infants who are born after a prolonged premature rupture of membranes and oligohydramnios. And some of these infants uh, actually end up having something what is called as a dry lung syndrome, where they may have elevated pulmonary pressures for the first day or two. If they have severe oligohydramnios, the magnitude of pulmonary hypertension may be even more prolonged. Sometimes uh, medications such as uh, maternal NSAIDs or neonatal ibuprofen cause, cause, can cause a premature closure of the ductus arteriosus or can cause decrease in process aglandin uh, production in the neonatal pulmonary circulation causing pulmonary hypertension. Uh, there are case reports of uh, neonatal ibuprofen actually causing pulmonary hypertension. Uh, but what we are going to focus on today is looking at pulmonary hypertension in the setting of a BPD. So if you look at a recent uh, systematic review of pulmonary hypertension in extremely preterm infants, uh, this is looking at all the infants without BPD. So that is, if you don't have BPD, overall your rate of pulmonary hypertension is extremely low. That is 0.02 is a proportion, or about 2% of these infants, so extremely low. It's not that it doesn't happen, but it's extremely unlikely. What about mild BPD? If the infant has mild BPD, the proportion is 0.04, about 4%. So slightly higher, but still more than 95% of the infants don't have pulmonary hypertension. What about moderate BPD? If you have moderate BPD, the risk increases from 4 to 8%. So it's a doubling of the rate. So no BPD, it's about 2%. Mild BPD, it's about 4%. Moderate BPD, it's about 8%. What about severe BPD? It's not 16%. It's actually a lot more. It's closer to 40% or 0.39. So it's only with severe BPD do you have a substantial number of infants with uh, pulmonary hypertension. So 0.39 or about 40% is a pretty substantial number. That means uh, four out of 10 infants with severe BPD will have pulmonary hypertension. Now, the very first prospective cohort of our study was from our group at uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham. The first author was uh, Ramachandra Bhatt, one of our fellows. And we looked at 172 extremely low birth weight infants uh, consecutively. And of them, we were able to screen 145 of them by echocardiogram at, starting at four to six weeks of age and then subsequent ones at monthly intervals. Of this 145, we found that nine had pulmonary hypertension at initial screening, but 136 did not. So of this nine with pulmonary hypertension at initial screening, that is about a month of age, uh, five of them still had persistent pulmonary hypertension and discharge. So more than half of them still had pulmonary hypertension when they were uh, going to go home. And three of them had resolved pulmonary hypertension uh, after they received oxygen or other therapy. And one of them uh, actually went home even without any specific treatment. 
Of the remaining 136 who did not have pulmonary hypertension with initial screening, 17 of them were subsequently diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension, usually around uh, three months of age. Um, and most of these infants also had persistent pulmonary hypertension and discharge, and some of them also uh, died. So of the 10 who had persistent pulmonary hypertension at discharge, uh, seven were discharged home on oxygen with medications, one on oxygen, but without other medications. Okay, so what were the risk factors for pulmonary hypertension? So if you look at the regression analysis, uh, adjusting for gestational age, sex, oxygen, and mechanical ventilation on day 28, uh, the variables which were important for birth weight. So as the birth weight increased, the odds ratios decreased. So larger infants are less likely to develop uh, pulmonary hypertension. Also, if the infant was growth restricted, SGA, they had a higher risk. So either the birth weight could be higher just because of uh, the, uh, a, the infant is AGA but a larger birth weight, uh, or the infant is an SGA and it is at a higher risk. So a lower birth weight, either because of just lower gestational age or be because of being SGA is an increased risk factor. Now we think that is because of decreased nutrition. If you don't have sufficient nutrition, your lungs don't grow. And if your lungs don't grow, the blood vessels in your lungs also don't grow. So nutrition is critically important to the growth of your blood vessels in the lungs. So ideally, baby should have a larger birth weight and should not be SGA. Now, uh, and it's also quite evident that infants who need more oxygen or who are on mechanical ventilation are at higher risk. So the uh, odds ratio adjusted is about five if you're needing more than 40% at day 28. And it's also higher if they are on mechanical ventilation at day 28. But look at the odds ratio is actually higher for oxygen than for mechanical ventilation. So oxygen need is actually a stronger predictor. And what about management of these infants? Um, most of these infants, like I said, required some management, uh, just a, a more oxygen and a, using a higher oxygenation threshold, which we shall discuss soon. Some of them needed uh, sildenafil or nitric oxide. And a few rare infants needed additional therapy, such as bosentan, which is the endothelin blocker, uh, or epoprostenol, which is a prostacyclin. Uh, Peter Morani from Colorado has also done quite a lot of work on pulmonary hypertension and has done a lot of uh, prospective studies. And uh, he screened infants with echocardiogram starting at seven days of age. So we are, now we are talking about screening with echocardiograms when they are still in the acute phase of uh, RDS or still in the RDS phase. And number, should, uh, sorry to interrupt. I mean, yeah. we are getting some interference on the slides. As you move, uh, the background is moving. Is it possible to turn off the background to none? Oh, okay. I will do that. Just a second. Because I don't know if it's related to that, but it's possible when you're moving. That's also. Let me see. Um, if you right click under the camera icon, you can say background. Yeah, or I can just, uh, maybe Yasser could just turn off my video. I mean, I don't see. No, it would be better if you can turn off the, because it would be nice to see you. Oh, okay. Right. Let me see. Um, Next to the camera icon, you can say background none. Yeah, I don't see it. For that, I will have to. In the Zoom video. Thing. Yeah, I'll have to minimize the screen. One second. No. Okay, one second. Uh, um... In the Zoom camera, I mean. In yeah, the Zoom right. Okay, is it better? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, uh, let me see if I can get back to, oh wait, okay, uh, here we are, okay, um, are you seeing my screen again? Yeah, your screen is back, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so um, this is the work done by Peter Morani who showed that uh, echocardiogram are done at seven days of age showed pulmonary hypertension in about 42% uh, of the infants. And this was a risk factor for both uh, late pulmonary hypertension as well as uh, BPD. Um, and if you do an echocardiogram at uh, 36 weeks postmenstrual age, that is when you normally diagnose BPD, uh, about 14% or one in seven infants had uh, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, 
So if you look down here, uh, you can see that if the infants had severe BPD, the rate of uh, pulmonary hypertension was about 30%. If they did not have BPD, it was much lower at 16%. And in this cohort, the rate of severe BPD was about 19%. Um, if, if they had early pulmonary hypertension, they had a higher risk of late pulmonary hypertension of about 21%. If they did not have early pulmonary hypertension, the risk of late pulmonary hypertension was lower. So what criteria are used for diagnosis of uh, pulmonary hypertension? So obviously, if there is a bidirectional or right to left shunt, uh, either at the PDA or at the PF4 or ASD or at the VSD, that would be suggestive. Um, or if you can quantitate a right ventricular uh, systolic pressure of more than 40, uh, such as using a tricuspid regurgitation uh, velocity, or if you have uh, a ratio of the RV systolic pressure or systolic blood pressure of more than 0.5. But what's most common and what's probably more uh, clinically relevant is septal wall flattening. So the highest sensitivity of uh, diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension is if you can identify any septal wall flattening that is either mild, moderate, or severe. So this is just a graph showing um, the different uh, rates of diagnosis using the different criteria. So the black bars are using any septal wall flattening and the grayer bars are the ones using different uh, thresholds. So the highest sensitivity is using uh, any septal wall of flattening. And how accurate is echocardiogram? We'll come to this again, but if you uh, take multiple echoes from multiple uh, uh, patients, and you give them all to different pediatric cardiologists, how likely are they to agree upon the presence of pulmonary hypertension? So overall, it's pretty good agreement. So it's about 82.9% agreement on the presence of pulmonary hypertension. So that is, uh, most of the time, they would agree with each other. And what happens if you read an echocardiogram today, then you come back to the same echocardiogram, say, next week. What is the probability that you will uh, agree with yourself? What is the intra-rater uh, agree, uh, agreement? So that's also pretty good, 92%. So there's a pretty good inter-rater and intra-rater agreement for diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, we shall come to this in a little more detail later. But basically, even though people agree that, yes, pulmonary hypertension is present, it's hard to uh, define the magnitude of pulmonary hypertension. So what are neonatologists doing? So this was an electronic survey of uh, neonatologists in the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, so there were 306 res uh, responders of 2,500 neonatologists. So one thing we can immediately learn is that neonatologists don't like to answer surveys, uh, only 12% response. Um, but of the people who did respond, about 38% uh, have an institutional screening protocol. Uh, this was about three years ago, so right now the numbers are probably a little bit higher. And most people would screen one day the infant needed mechanical ventilation or oxygen at 36 weeks. And uh, some people did not screen any infants. But most neonatologists who are practicing for more than five years have noticed that the numbers of these infants are increasing, perhaps because we are increasing our survival of all these infants with severe BPD. 45% uh, of, of people had also noticed uh, pulmonary vein stenosis in association with BPD, and 90% of neonatologists had used anti-pulmonary hypertensive uh, medications. But there's a lot of uh, variation between different centers. So the gray bars are the rates at which people do echocardiograms, and the black bars are the rates at which pulmonary hypertension is diagnosed. So you can see there's a wide range in the rates of echocardiogram and a wide range in the rates of pulmonary hypertension diagnosis. But there is no correlation between center prevalence of uh, pulmonary hypertension and the use of echocardiogram, telling us that other factors are probably uh, playing a part. There is also a lot of variation between centers in what people do. Uh, 
some people use a lot of nitric oxide, some people use a lot of sildenafil, but again, there's a lot of variation between uh, centers. And there's no correlation between center prevalence of pulmonary hypertension and the use of either nitric oxide or sildenafil. Let's go down to the basic uh, pathology and the pathogenesis. So uh, people think of BPD as just an immature lung on which you have uh, mechanotrauma, that is uh, ventilation-induced lung injury and hyperoxy-induced lung injury, but actually it's a little bit more complex. So you have an immature lung, all right, but then you have various genomic factors, various environmental determinants, volume trauma, infection, impaired nutrition, hyperoxia, fluid overload, and all that. You had all listened to the talk on BPD and uh, PDA just a little while ago, so this must be familiar. And this leads to various intermediate phenotypes, inflammation, apoptosis, atelectasis, which leads to inhibition of lung development and abnormal lung vascular development, resulting in long-term impairment of lung function and pulmonary hypertension. So this is just a picture from human lungs, both normal on the left uh, and uh, BPD on the right. So you can see all these small alveoli, that's normal. But here in BPD, you can see that these alveoli are much larger. So that, that's basically the lungs are being fixed in the saccular stage. You don't have true alveoli. You're seeing much less alveolar septa being uh, formed. And you can look at this arrow pointing to this blood vessel, which is much thicker. And you can also look at this airway, that's a bron uh, bronchiole. You can see that the airway epithelium is showing necrosis. So the blood vessel is also showing uh, thickening, uh, suggesting uh, that this infant probably had pulmonary hypertension. But what happens to the microvasculature? So previously, people used to think that there's inhibition of microvascular development. But if you actually do quantitation on autopsy lung sections, you actually find that there are more endothelial cells in these long-term ventilated patients compared to age-matched uh, late controls. So there is an increase in the microvasculature, so, but it is dysmorphic, not deficient. So there are different patterns of angiogenic growth factors compared to normal. So it is dysmorphic and dysregulated. It is not just uh, deficient. So there are more blood vessels, but they're not where they should be. There are also what we call IAVs, that is intrapulmonary arteriovenous and astomotic uh, vessels. So this was shown in a very excellent detail by Dr. Steve Admans' group. So uh, these are like 3D reconstructions of uh, the normal perinatal lung as well as uh, BPD lung. And you can see that normally you have uh, the pulmonary artery which takes blood to the lungs. Uh, the blood goes through the alveoli, becomes oxygenated and comes out through the pulmonary veins. Uh, but what happens with these uh, intrapulmonary artery venous anastomotic vessels is that it's a direct connection between the pulmonary artery and vein. So the blood bypasses the alveoli. It's basically an intrapulmonary shunt. Uh, leading to uh, hypoxemia due to the shunt. So you could try adjusting your mean airway pressure, try adjusting your FiO2, you could try doing all those things. But basically, if you're having an intrapulmonary shunt, uh, all those maneuvers are not likely to help and this infant may have persistent uh, hypoxemia. What is the rate of cardiovascular anomalies contributing to pulmonary hypertension? So this is a retrospective review of only a few patients, uh, 29 patients with BPD and pulmonary hypertension. Uh, two thirds of these infants, that is 19 out of 29, had cardiovascular anomalies. And what kind of anomalies were they? Nine of them had iotopulmonary collaterals, that is large collaterals uh, directly from the systemic circulation to the pulmonary circulation. Seven of these 29 had pulmonary vein stenosis. Uh, four had uh, large ASDs and nine had a hemodynamically significant uh, PDA. Uh, right now, there is a lot of, uh, I would say, emphasis on developmental origins of disease. There is a lot of these things are not uh, postnatal events, but they actually start well in the intrauterine period. So maternal PIH and severe growth restriction, I mentioned earlier the severe uh, growth restriction or SGA is a risk factor for BPD and pulmonary hypertension. But we know that if the 
placenta is bad. That is, if there is maternal vascular underperfusion and reduced placental villus vascularity, if the placenta doesn't have too many blood vessels, then the baby's internal organs, including the lung, also have fewer blood vessels. Now, there are multiple biomarkers in the cord blood uh, which can uh, indicate that there's maternal vascular underperfusion, such as placental growth factor, GCSF, which predict uh, pulmonary hypertension. People have done metabolomic studies too, which have shown that various metabolites uh, are consistent with fetal growth restriction in the infants who later develop pulmonary hypertension. So you could pretty much predict which infants are at high risk of developing pulmonary hypertension, even close to birth. So can we actually prevent pulmonary hypertension in the setting of PPD? Uh, this was a recent uh, retrospective chart review of 252 extremely preterm infants who underwent echocardiogram prior to discharge. So um, from 2012 to 2015, they used a lower saturation limit of uh, SpO2, that is 88 to 92%. But in the most recent years, 2015 to 2016, they used a higher threshold, 90 to 95, from the support trial. And it was seen that the higher SPO2 group had a lower risk of pulmonary hypertension. The hazard ratio was 0.5. So they had only half the risk of uh, pulmonary hypertension. But they also had a lower rate of uh, elevated pulmonary uh, vascular resistance. Again, hazard ratio of 0.55. The time to pulmonary hypertension development was shorter in the lower SPO2 group than in the higher SPO2 group. That is, if you keep your saturations lower, it's more likely that there'll be some pulmonary vasoconstriction, and these are more likely to develop pulmonary hypertension. And these are some graphs from the paper. Uh, the blue uh, line is, are the ones with a low saturation threshold, and the red line is the ones with a higher saturation threshold. And the y-axis, basically, uh, the top two graphs is the risk of pulmonary hypertension, and the bottom two graphs, the rate of the pulmonary vascular resistance. And you can see that uh, the rates are much higher in the uh, infants with uh, the lower saturation threshold. Uh, we talked about this briefly, about a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension based on echo. So it's quite sensitive, about 80% sensitive. But the magnitude of pulmonary hypertension is difficult to determine and is not very accurate because less than 10% of these infants actually have a tricuspid regurgitant jet. So if you don't have a TR jet, it's hard to uh, have good quantitation. But there is pretty good agreement among cardiologists as to the, whether or not pulmonary hypertension is present. So there are some centers where cardiac cath is uh, being increasingly used. And you would need to do cardiac cath, especially if you're suspecting pulmonary vein stenosis, left ventricular dysfunction, or if you want to do vasoreactivity testing to oxygen or uh, nitric oxide. There are many centers which also uh, do uh, biomarker testing, uh, which may help in early diagnosis and following the course. Uh, what I use uh, at my institution is a BNP, which is B-type natriuretic peptide, which is elevated in BPD, pulmonary hypertension, and is associated with mortality. Uh, important to remember that BNP basically is an indicator of ventricular stretch. It doesn't tell you that the infant has pulmonary hypertension. It just tells you that one of the ventricles is being stretched. So you could have elevated BNPC in with just a PDA. Remember that if you have a PDA, it's a left ventricle which is taking the strain, and so you would be having a left ventricular dilation. With pulmonary hypertension, you would have right ventricular dilation. So regardless of which ventricle is being dilated, you would have an elevation of uh, BNP. Uh, there are some research papers which, in, which tell us that uh, ADMA or asymmetric dimethyl arginine uh, is increased in infants with pulmonary hypertension. There's an increase of uh, uh, rate, uh, rate of uh, endostatin to angiopoietin 1 in these infants too. Uh, there are also more pro-inflammatory cytokines such as uh, IL-6, IL-8, IL-10 and so forth and TNF-alpha. Um, but again, these are not things that we measure routinely. The BNP is one of the things that we can measure uh, routinely. Uh, if you are doing uh, cardiac cath, you can uh, do uh, AVR, that is acute vasoreactivity testing. That is, while you're measuring the pulmonary vascular pressures and pulmonary vascular resistance, you can expose them to 100% oxygen, or you can add nitric oxide or take off nitric oxide. And uh, 
the infants who have a better prognosis are the ones to show that they are still vasoreactive. So early in the course, most of these infants are vasoreactive, and if you give them more oxygen or nitric oxide, they're able to vasodilate. But if you have a fixed uh, component of the pulmonary hypertension, uh, then it's a worse prognosis. There are various uh, guidelines that the American Heart Association and American Thoracic Society have come out for uh, BPD and BPD with pulmonary hypertension. And they basically state that screening for pulmonary hypertension is recommended in established BPD. Uh, and that you need to evaluate and treat lung disease, uh, including trying to uh, fix the known problems such as hypoxemia, aspiration, structural airway disease, and so forth, before you start treating the pulmonary hypertension. That is, until you fix the underlying problem, uh, trying to fix pulmonary hypertension isn't all that uh, useful. And obviously, you want to identify disease severity and potential contributing factors such as diastolic dysfunction, pulmonary vein stenosis, and so forth. Now, important to remember that most of these guidelines are class one in which benefits are probably more than risks, but the level of evidence is usually a class B, meaning this is from a single randomized trial or multiple non-randomized studies. So these are not... Uh, data from multiple randomized trials. So this is not high level data. And this is the algorithm developed by Tracy and Confield, uh, again, showing what's a potential uh, way to manage these infants. Uh, that is, you could do an early echocardiogram if the infant is on high ventilator settings or on oxygen and it's not improving quickly. Or at 36 weeks, if they're still on a ventilator, poor growth and elevated uh, CO2, and then you could, uh, if, they do, if, they, if they do have pulmonary hypertension, you've got to evaluate and treat lung disease, and you could follow it with echoes and uh, BNP. And if you have ongoing pulmonary hypertension, then they would suggest a cardiac uh, cat. Uh, currently, though, most people would try one vasodilator or maybe two vasodilators before going to cardiac cat because the experience of cardiac cat is uh, kind of limited in these small infants. BPD and pulmonary hypertension, and many of them are medically fragile, and it's quite risky to take them to the cardiac cath lab. But anyway, uh, we need a multidisciplinary team of neonatologists, pulmonologists, cardiologists, and pulmonary hypertension specialists to be involved in the care of these infants. And obviously, uh, you would need a screening echocardiogram for multiple types of infants, like we had discussed earlier. So what should you look at in the echocardiogram? It should include a complete anatomic evaluation to identify and characterize uh, the physiologic contribution of structural abnormalities, stunts, and pulmonary veins. Uh, should assess the right and left ventricular sizes, hypertrophy, systolic, and diastolic function. Uh, and importantly, you should look for the septal positioning. Is it uh, flattened? Is it bulging into the right ventricle or bulging into the left ventricle? And if there is any tricuspid or pulmonary regurgitant jet, uh, the velocity should be measured. And obviously, you should need a simultaneous systemic blood pressure documentation to find out what it is in relation to uh, the pulmonary pressures. Um, they also recommend that uh, biomarkers like BNP or uh, pro-BNP can be measured. And obviously, you need to evaluate and treat uh, comorbidities. Uh, in selected cases, cardiac cath should be performed, uh, and they actually recommend prior to the addition of combination drug therapy. That is, if you are giving one agent and the infant does not respond, before adding a second agent or third agent, you want to take the infant for a cardiac cath. Uh, especially because if the infant has, say, pulmonary vein stenosis, what would happen if you start at infant to nitric oxide? So nitric oxide is a pulmonary vasodilator. So if you increase your pulmonary blood flow in the setting of pulmonary vein stenosis, you would uh, cause more pulmonary edema in the infant. So you would actually make the infant sicker. Or suppose the infant has uh, left ventricular dysfunction. So if you give that infant nitric oxide, again, uh, you'll be increasing pulmonary blood flow but it, blood flow is not going to uh, get back through the heart quite as easily because of the left ventricular dysfunction. So um, it is important that if the infant is not responding to drug treatment, to do a cardiac cath to see if there's any uh, underlying problem. 
especially pulmonary vein stenosis uh, or diastolic uh, dysfunction. Um, it is recommended that oxygen saturations be maintained between 92 and 95 percent in patients with established BPD and pulmonary hypertension. So similar to what Dr. Vineet Bandari mentioned in the previous talk, we set our alarm limits between 88 and 95, with the goal between uh, 90 and 95 in, uh, in preterm infants. But suppose the infant develops pulmonary hypertension, then we reset the limit slightly higher. So instead of 91 to 95, we set it as 92 to 95 or 92 to 96. So we set the alarm limits at 91 to 97. So your target range is one uh, less so, uh, than what the limits are because you don't want the alarms to be going off all the time. So if you set the alarm limits between 91 and 97, you're basically targeting 92 to 95 or 92 to 96 percent. So nitric oxide should be used for acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis and weaned after stabilization. And what we usually do is uh, once they start nitric oxide, we give it for a week or so. And if the infant is showing improvement, then we add uh, sildenafil uh, therapy. I'll come to the doses in a little while. Um, PH targeted therapy should be considered for infant BPD and sustained pulmonary hypertension after optimal treatment. Uh, these infants should have outpatient follow-up. So just because we as neonatologists take care of these infants doesn't mean that once they go home, they are fine. Uh, most of these infants, like I will discuss briefly, will still have persistent problems. They need to be followed up by a specialist. So uh, therapy of pulmonary hypertension in preterm infants. So the important uh, caveat here is, as I've shown here with this uh, uh, yellow diamond is there's a lack of evidence for most of these things. So we really need more hard data on management. What we are going to be talking today is about management of pulmonary hypertension and BPD. On, as I just mentioned, it's uh, management of BPD, oxygen therapy, minimize hypoxia, and specific uh, vasodilator therapy if needed. Um, Oxygen therapy, like I mentioned, keeping saturations a little higher would reduce hypoxic vasoconstriction. And you want to avoid factors which can cause hypoxia, such as bronchospasm. Um, pulmonary vasodilators are of unknown efficacy. I mean, they work in animal models. They work if you are doing a cardiac cath and you can show that they cause vasodilation. But what is their long-term effect? That we don't really know. Uh, there are multiple agents, nitric oxide, prostacycline analogs, bosentan, there's also ambricentan and cetaxentan, which are selective endothelin A receptor blockers, uh, various cyclic uh, or the cyclic GMP uh, agonists or things which increase cyclic GMP, like soluble uh, guanyl cyclase uh, stimulators, such as riosiguat and sinasiguat. Um, but uh, many of them are still experimental in this population. So again, you can uh, affect the prostacycline uh, pathway, you can affect the nitric oxide pathway, or it can affect the endothelin uh, pathway, the three major pathways affecting uh, pulmonary uh, basal modulation. Um, as I briefly mentioned, uh, use of pulmonary vasodilators may be detrimental in infant with cardiopulmonary anomalies. So if you have pulmonary vein stenosis, cytopulmonary collaterals, or left ventricular dysfunction, and you use nitric oxide or uh, process cycling, uh, then they may get worse because they're increasing pulmonary blood flow but not increasing outflow. Uh, so cardiac cath may be necessary in these infants. So if you don't have the facilities to do cardiac cath in many of these infants, you can start the vasodilator but carefully monitor them afterwards to make sure they're not getting uh, sicker. If they do get sicker, then you probably need a cardiac cath. Uh, the pulmonary vasodilators that are commonly used, uh, sildenafil, uh, we usually start at a lower dose and increase slowly. Uh, and generally, we max out at 10 milligram Q8 hours. That is not more than 30 milligrams a day, regardless of the weight of the infant. Uh, there are known uh, side effects, but fortunately, it's, uh, they are quite rare in this population, especially for the larger BPD infants. Uh, Bosentan is a drug which is quite toxic. Uh, th these infants need to be monitored for liver dysfunction and anemia. So they need to be uh, monitored for liver function tests and CBCs weekly. Mm. Uh, Iloprost, Iproprostanol, uh, again, experience is quite limited. Very few centers use them. Mildrenone uh, obviously needs an intravenous line and uh, 
can cause hypertension. Uh, so we don't use it unless the infant already has existing IV access or is critically uh, ill. The most evidence is that the sildenafil, there have been multiple studies done, no serious adverse effects reported. However, you've got to remember that uh, these infants with BPD and pulmonary hypertension, they have an extremely high mortality. Uh, so it's uh, really hard to say what the long-term effects are with sildenafil because a large number of these infants die because of their underlying uh, lung disease. The ones who do survive show improvement in pulmonary pressures and respiratory uh, scores. So potential approach to pulmonary hypertension, uh, what we do is we do early identification. We screen all preterm infants less than 29 weeks with an echocardiogram at about a month of age. Uh, and then um, at uh, monthly intervals, and they're still on a ventilator or CPAP or needing a lot of oxygen. Uh, and we occasionally do a cardiac cath if they don't respond to uh, one agent at high doses or to two uh, agents. So risk stratification, again, like I mentioned, it's possible to identify which infants are at higher risk. There is the infants who are smaller, more preterm, more growth restricted, and needing higher settings. Uh, and a better understanding of the pathophysiology may lead to uh, development of new therapies, optimizing existing therapies or personalized uh, therapies. And we really need more randomized trials to evaluate existing experimental therapies and future therapies. So there are a lot of potential therapies, but we don't necessarily know how well all of them work. So the natural history uh, in this study published a year ago, uh, of all infants with the BPD, most of them severe. Mortality is associated with increased severity of pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary pressures are higher in those who died. And at follow up, uh, one third of these infants are still on pharmacologic therapy or oxygen. The two thirds apparently had resolution of the pulmonary hypertension at about three years of correct age. Uh, this is another study uh, published this year of 101 patients with BPD pulmonary hypertension, uh, about 100 of them being treated with sildenafil, some of them with bosentan and other agents. Uh, about a third of these infants died during the study period, and of this third, uh, one third of them were secondary to severe pulmonary hypertension. And at about a follow-up of about five years, uh, it is seen that only uh, a quarter of them are still on medications. 77% were weaned off pulmonary hypertension medications at about two years of age. Intermediate term impact. Uh, so this is a study from the Children's Hospital National Consortium. So this is a large sample size, about 1,677 infants, less than 32 weeks. Pulmonary hypertension was seen in about 22%. Uh, as uh, would be obvious, uh, it's associated with higher mortality, more ventilator support, and so forth. Uh, more of these infants need tracheostomy, about 27% versus 9%. 84% needed supplemental oxygen. Uh, more of them needed tube feeds and so forth. And these infants are at higher risk of uh, being readmitted. Uh, Long-term impact. Uh, at one year of age, uh, they still have abnormal uh, pulmonary vascular disease. And even if you look at them at uh, school year, that is 11 to 14 years of age, if you look at babies who are born preterm versus term, the preterm infants had greater tricuspid regurgitant velocity. And the infants who had BPD as preterm infants had a higher tricuspid regurgitant velocity compared to preterm no BPD infants. So a term baby, assuming they're normal, is 1.95. Preterm no BPD is 2.15 and preterm BPD is 2.25. So even infants without BPD still have abnormal uh, pulmonary vasculature. And what happens to babies who are born preterm and who don't have BPD who are doing fine otherwise? So if you look at them as young adults, so this is by Kara Goss. So she took young adults who are very low birth weight average gestational age 28 weeks as infants, and she did a cardiac cath on them, at least a right heart cath. And she found that uh, three out of these 11 uh, young adults had borderline pulmonary hypertension, and two out of 11 had overt pulmonary hypertension. And their uh, parameters indicated stiffer pulmonary vasculature, and they were less able to augment cardiac index. So even if they are not on oxygen, if they're not on medication, 
all the preterm infants, when they become young adults, they are likely to have some evidence of pulmonary hypertension. So it's not something that becomes totally normal. They do have some persistent abnormalities. And what happens to them as adults? So if you have to do cardiac MRI in adults 20 to 39 years of age, uh, in kids who are 30 weeks at birth, um, they have a greater LV mass. I mean, you know that preterm infants have a higher risk of systemic hypertension. And they also had a greater right ventricular mass and lower right ventricular ejection fraction. So again, even as young adults, they have abnormal uh, hemodynamics. Uh, so in conclusion, um, all our operational definitions, I mean, BPD and pulmonary hypertension, they don't capture the phenotypic and genetic heterogeneity underlying pathogenesis. Uh, pulmonary hypertension occurs in a fifth of extreme low birth weight infants primarily those with moderate or severe BPD, but it can happen even in infants who do not have uh, BPD. And it persists to discharge in many infants. And it can actually persist even into childhood or young adult life. We don't know what happens when they are 40 or 60 years old because uh, we haven't really followed up infants that long. Uh, generally, it's, uh, by echocardiogram, and some infants may need cardiac cath, especially if they don't respond to vasodilators. Uh, reduction of pulmonary hypertension is possible, but we need to uh, implement proven interventions, such as antenatal steroids, more use of CPAP, uh, caffeine, uh, vitamin A, uh, good nutrition. Well, as I mentioned, nutrition is critically important to lung development and lung vascular development. We also need more evidence on common interventions. Uh, we need to do randomized trials on diuretics, bronchodilators, PDA management. Uh, there's still a lot of controversy over the PDA as uh, from the talk earlier today. Uh, do we know if diuretics work long term? Do we know if bronchodilators work long term? We don't know that, yet a lot of people keep using them. Uh, we need evidence of therapies currently used for pulmonary hypertension. What's the long-term effects of sildenafil, uh, nitric oxide, and so forth. We need better analysis of long-term outcomes. And we need careful QI processes and monitoring of outcomes because uh, we want to make sure that uh, just because somebody has a problem, we start therapy and we think that we are doing good, but we want to make sure that things actually don't get worse. So we need to make sure that outcomes get better, not worse. So there are some questions that need to be answered. Uh, do all infants with BPD have abnormal pulmonary vasculature? That's probably true. Is pulmonary hypertension just a threshold effect? That is, uh, by our definition, um, are we just detecting vascular remodeling beyond a detectable threshold? How much of it is fixed versus how much is dynamic? And uh, do all preterm infants have persistent abnormalities in the pulmonary vasculature? And how should we monitor them? Who is going to monitor them? And is there a different genetic basis for these infants to develop pulmonary hypertension versus those who just have a BPD? And what specific uh, prophylactic or therapeutic uh, strategies can be used to prevent or treat BPD? So a lot of unanswered questions, but I think we are uh, making progress. I think I can stop now. Uh, there are uh, a lot of ongoing research, uh, such as cardiac MRI, various new biomarkers, and so forth. But uh, it'll probably take another five to 10 years before we actually start doing any of those things. Uh, thank you. OK. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ambala Bhajan. This is a uh, really a very interesting uh, lecture. I think a lot of uh, practical issues as well. Uh, so I think we are open for uh, questioning. Anyone has any question? I believe there was one question here with me. Uh, can I, I know be used in preterm infants? Um, so um, there have been multiple trials of I know in preterm infants. Uh, I know does not work for prevention of BPD. So using nitric oxide prophylactically does not seem to help uh, human preterm infants. It seems to work in animal models, but hasn't really been shown to work in human infants. There's just one study by Mike Schreiber uh, from Chicago, which showed possible improvement in uh, the subpopulation. Um, also, but all the other studies, such as the uh, European nitric oxides trial, the UNO trial, uh, did not show any benefit. However, uh, 
what we are focused on is uh, would nitric oxide work in in front of BPD and pulmonary hypertension? That is, we're not talking about preventing BPD, but about the infants who already have BPD and who have pulmonary hypertension. Um, we have done some studies in which we have exposed these infants to nitric oxide and then followed them up, and many of them have a reduction in pulmonary pressures. Uh, but again, this, these are case series or retrospective cohorts. Uh, there have been no large randomized trials to show that there is long-term benefit. But people still use nitric oxide, uh, at least initially, for management of pulmonary hypertensive crisis in this population. And they usually transition them to sildenafil in about two weeks. Thank you, Dr. Ambulavan. It was a very interesting talk. And uh, obviously, mm -hmm. um, the figures in the article published this year are not very promising. In the babies with well-established BPD beyond 36 weeks, we had a similar case recently where uh, the baby had a significant PDA, but uh, the treatment was delayed. and. Around 35 weeks corrected age, the PDA was ligated, and that actually led to some worsening of the condition. So, uh, are we better off? I mean, uh, starting steroids uh, maybe to reduce the lung disease rather than uh, treating the PDA at this stage with the ligation, because it seems like the circulation has made some adaptation, and then the baby, I mean, baby passed away ultimately, even though we struggled, did not respond to any of the treatment. We didn't do a cardiac care, but we had a trial with both sildenafil and and, then, and uh, we had multiple doses of steroids in desperation, but didn't make much difference. It was fibrosis on the X-ray as well. It's like old BPD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think even though people call this as old BPD and new BPD, I think we still see a lot of the old BPD. Uh, it's not like it's gone away. We still see a sufficient uh, number of infants with overlap between the inhibition of lung development and the fibrosis. And I agree that many of these infants are very hard to take care of. Uh, you don't want to end up uh, ligating all infants with a PDA. But at the same time, if you have an infant with uh, severe BPD and a large PDA, which is hemodynamically significant, uh, we may need to consider doing something about it before the infant develops corpulmonal, because then uh, once you have right to left shunting, then it's uh, hard to fix. Sometimes what uh, our cardiologists do is they take them to the cardiac cath lab and they use one of these device closures uh, temporarily. So you can put in the device, blow up the balloon, close the PDA and see if it uh, helps uh, uh, the hemodynamics. If the infant gets worse, then you can uh, basically uh, stop trying to ligate the PDA or stop trying to close the PDA. Uh, if it looks like the infant benefits, then you can probably do that. Uh, also important to remember that many of these infants in whom you try to close the PDA later, um, remember that the uh, left ventricle will decompensate after you close the PDA because the left ventricle has become used to pumping against a low resistance circuit with the open PDA and now suddenly it closed the PDA, the left ventricle can't pump against a much higher systemic low resistance. So you can have uh, decompensation of the left ventricle and then these infants get uh, sicker. So most of these infants end up needing a lot of milrinone for the first week or so uh, post ligation. Okay, I think uh, there is one interesting question from Dr. Avijit Singla. Uh -huh. uh, he thank you for the informative talk and uh, he's talking that the echocardiographic criteria for pulmonary hypertension and mentioned by you can be used in early days of life. What about the echo criteria for pulmonary hypertension in established BPD since it is hard to you know um, hard to find special flattening and shunt across the duct or PFO in really corrected term, babies of 36 to 38 weeks? Uh, um, a question, probably. Yes, uh, I think most cardiologists still use the same criteria. It's, it's a little harder to uh, look for those things, but I think they still use the same criteria. Uh, I think the septal flattening is one of the more sensitive criteria. Uh, most of the time, you don't really see much uh, shunting uh, in these infants. Uh, I mean, because uh, most of these infants with established BPD, you have intrapulmonary shunt, you don't necessarily have uh, intracardiac shunt. 
Okay, uh, one more question. What is the right age for tracheostomy for BPD patients? And can it be, uh, you know, can it impact any development of uh, pulmonary hepatitis in BPD? Uh, that's a very complicated question about when a tracheostomy is indicated. Uh, if you ask uh, six uh, neonatologists, you will get 20 opinions. Uh, because yes. uh, that's correct. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it, it depends a lot on the infant. Um, mm. I think doing a tracheostomy before three months of age is too early. And I think waiting to one year of age is probably too late. So it's somewhere in the middle. Um, most neonatologists I've seen, most centers, there's a lot of variation from one center to another. Uh, I think the earliest I've seen is starting at around four months of age and going on up to six to eight months of age. Uh, and I think the question about whether it actually impacts development of pulmonary hypertension, uh, probably not. Uh, I think what a tracheostomy does is it helps improve airway management. It doesn't really fix the underlying lung problem. Uh, but it might also improve uh, the ability of you to interact with the infant as the infant gets older, close to a year of age. Thank you. I mean, in terms of the angiogenesis that you mentioned and the shunting, I mean, is there anything we can do about that part? Uh, most of the dysregulated angiogenesis we think is secondary to uh, inflammation. Uh, and this inflammation is often secondary to uh, volutrauma or secondary to chorioamnionitis and infections. So again, the same things which uh, help for BPD, that is preventing infections, preventing uh, too much oxygen, preventing too much uh, uh, tidal volume, all those things also would help for uh, better vascular development too. So nothing specific. What about the retinopathy treatment with the uh, the uh, Yes, okay. so yeah, that's a good point. So um, the problem with uh, ROP again, like you mentioned, is abnormal angiogenesis in the retina, and the question is, what happens when uh, you try to fix the blood vessels in the retina? How much of that? Uh, uh, anti-VEGF uh, inhibitor actually gets into the circulation and how much of it can affect blood vessel growth, say, in the lungs. Currently, I think the evidence is not very clear about how much of it gets to the lung. I think there is only a minimal effect on lung development. So I think if you have multiple doses of this bevacizumab, uh, Avastin, and other things for uh, ROP, then there may be some effect on lung angiogenesis. But I'm not uh, sure that's going to be a significant effect, maybe a small effect. I'm actually more concerned about uh, uh, beta adrenergic agonists, things like uh, either beta blockers like propranolol because they inhibit vascular development, or beta adrenergic agents like uh, albutamol, albuterol, salbutamol, those kinds of agents, because they can also affect angiogenesis. And we don't know what their effects are on the lung angiogenesis. People need to study it, but nobody has studied it so far. So, uh, there's one more question that was asked to Bandari. We repeat that as well. I uh -huh. mean, what is the role of inhaled steroids in your view, and do you use them in your view? Uh, Inhaled steroids uh, have not been shown to uh, uh, benefit uh, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, they do reduce BPD to some extent, uh, but if you look at this recent study by uh, Bassler et al. in the New England Journal, they reduce BPD, but they also increase mortality. Uh, so generally, most centers don't uh, use prolonged courses of inhaled steroids. Um, what we sometimes do is, uh, if the infant has a high systemic steroid requirement, we sometimes give them inhaled steroids to reduce the amount of systemic steroids they need. Not to uh, not inhale steroids by itself, but more as an add-on to reduce systemic steroids. Sometimes it gives uh, inhaled steroids briefly, trying to get them over a brief uh, episode of uh, lung inflammation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anwar, do you have any questions? No, I think uh, I don't have any more questions. 
So our experience with the uh, inhaled steroid is similar to what you described. I mean, in a baby who has been extubated after the DART regime, for example, we give it to maintain it for a few days. Uh, yeah. and if the baby uh, has a, I mean, if the baby is stuck on a high FAO2 on CPAP or NAPPV, for example, we try it for mm -hmm. a week to 10 days. And it does help in some babies, but doesn't work all the time. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, Anak. Yeah, we, we, we have the same, similar experience. I don't think mm -hmm. we have used uh, in steroid, but uh, it doesn't seem to work really. Quite a long time even uh, we have used possibly, and you cannot use for uh, two, three or four weeks. Uh, after some time, we need to stop it. For, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Thank as Dr. You. Bhandari, Bhandari was telling that uh, in steroid might take effect after three to four weeks. Is that correct? Well, we see he's back online, but uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, it's more of uh, maintenance I mean, rather than yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Like like Amal is meant, you know, if you if you start in steroid, you're not the earliest. You can see some response if you talk to pediatric pulmonologists. They'll tell you, you know, when they use it for asthma and other reactive airway disease, mm -hmm. it takes weeks for it to have an effect. That's um, right. So it's, as Amal just mentioned, it's probably just useful for maintenance therapy. Um, rather than trying to like, definitely does not seem to decrease PPD um, or really decrease the severity of PPD, even if you use it early. So we would try, I would try to avoid using it at that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ambalavanan. And uh, now we have uh, uh, Rajesh to take over and uh, give the final words. Uh, really great session. And uh, thank you, Dr. Anwar, Dr. Hisham, Dr. Junaid for uh, chairing the session as well, and Monica for special efforts in organizing such a wonderful session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Rajesh, you are muted. Thank you, Sridhar. And I would like to thank all the speaker, chairpersons and moderators, uh, especially the three learned speakers who have given their time for us. And the National Unitology Forum of India, UAE chapter, Deeply thank you from core of our heart for all the effort you have taken. And we are, I'm sure that we would be interacting with you all again after some time on many more topics. Our next topic uh, will be on NEC and we will probably share the dates with you later on. And on that note, I would like to thank all of you and uh, end the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Any questions we will post to uh, uh, Dr. Ambal and uh, Dr. Vineet. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see I have a private you know, message from Dr. Anwar. I'm just going to put my email address there so that you can then share it with everybody else. Yeah, please. Now, Dr. Anwar, I did respond to two of your questions uh, you had sent me. Yes. I'll just share my email address and then you can have people email sure. up to me. Thank yeah, you. And uh, to tell you, we had around 800 plus delegates, so that you know, all of them were really keen to listen to uh, you guys. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs>